Okay, so this is the foreword to Rethinking the Industrial Revolution, Five Centuries of Transition from Agrarian to Industrial Capitalism in England by Michael Andrew Zmolik. Uh, all right. Forward. Words of warning. There's something of a tradition where books on the Industrial Revolution are concerned. It seems almost obligatory to begin with some words of caution about the scope of the subject, what it is, what it is not. Writing in 1917, the Hammonds cautioned us that, quote, there is a sense in which it is impossible to explain anything without explaining everything. It is true, again, that there is an element of risk in any general statement about the Industrial Revolution, end quote. Eleven years later, Paul Mantu cautioned that not only did the causes of the Industrial Revolution remain a mystery, but also that, quote, in spite of the apparent rapidity of its development, the Industrial Revolution sprang from far distant causes and was destined to produce consequences whose process of development was, after more than a century, is still incomplete. The distinctive characteristics of the factory system did not reveal themselves all at once. End quote. Twenty years later still, T.S. Ashton published his 1948 classic, The Industrial Revolution, 1760 to 1830, a concise account about a, a concise account which remains among the most widely read texts on the subject. Ashton begins by cautioning us about using the term quote capitalism, end quote but asks us to accede to the common understanding and usage of the term, quote, industrial revolution, end quote. Quote, the system of human relationships that is sometimes called capitalism had its origins long before 1760 and attained its full development long after 1830. There is a danger of overlooking the essential fact of continuity. But the phrase industrial revolution has been used by a long line of historians and has become so firmly embedded in common speech that it would be pedantic to offer a substitute." End quote. Writing 18 years after this, Michael Flynn also justifies this usage, quote, "...disaggregated, the individual elements in the Industrial Revolution look gradual and undramatic enough, viewed as a whole, the process amounts to a sufficiently drastic upheaval to justify, in spite of the historians of the interwar years, the expression industrial revolution. Yet Flynn qualifies this by stating that, quote, the process of growth is complex and any attempt to explain an industrial revolution in terms of a single prime mover is bound to be misleading. Inevitably, a wide range of factors is involved and each of these factors has its own chronology. Thus, the chronology of an industrial revolution is the sum of a large number of contributory, contributory chronologies." End quote. The present study will challenge such a view by suggesting that we must understand that there were multiple processes at work, that, that while we must understand that there were, there were multiple processes at work, it may be possible to place these processes in a larger framework to gain a more coherent understanding. Three years after Flynn wrote this, Peter Matthias's First Industrial Nation was published. Matthias and many other authors of the succeeding period would appear to have heeded Flynn's advice, for his was one of a great many books that undertook a sector-by-sector -sector analysis of the Industrial Revolution, one chapter per sector. Peter Matthias begins his 1969 work with his own words of caution, quote, The term industrial revolution should not be used to denote industrial or mechanical innovation, an advance in technique of production, or the mechanization of a process in a single industry, or even the conversion of a single industry into a mass production basis with large plants driven by more than human power. If the concept is to mean only this, then the search for its origin would be lost in the remote past." End quote. Here we have a repetition of the theme that the Industrial Revolution involved multiple complex and interwoven complexes. But in what way could we employ the term with precision? Let us attempt to answer that question by breaking the term into its component parts. 
There is little ambiguity about the fact that this event was characterized by rapid change within and rapid growth of industry. The problem would seem to lie with the word, quote, revolution, end quote. Writing a decade after Matthias, the master of the long durée himself, Fernand Bradell, concludes his magnum opus, Civilization and Capitalism, with a chapter on the Industrial Revolution. There, not surprisingly, too, Bradell offers words of caution, but here specifically about the term, quote, revolution. Quote, historians are often criticized for misusing the word revolution, which, it is argued, ought to be used in the original sense to refer only to violent and rapid change. But when one is talking about social phenomenon, rapid and slow change are inseparable. For no society exists which is not constantly torn between the forces working to preserve it and the subversive forces, whether perceived as such or not, working to undermine it. Revolutionary explosions are but the sudden and short-lived volcanic eruptions of this latent and long-term conflict. In any attempt to analyze the revolutionary process, the most difficult part is their relationship and the links between them. The Industrial Revolution in England at the end of the 1700s is no exception. It consisted both of a rapid sequence of events and of what was clearly a very long-term process. Two different rhythms were beating simultaneously." End quote. Footnote. Bordeaux goes on to cite Phyllis Dean for her reminder that the discontinuities in the English economy of the late 18th century were contained within a historical continuum which, quote, breaks and discontinuities lose their identities as unique or decisive events, end quote. Additionally, Burdell warns that David Landis's description of the Industrial Revolution, quote, as the formation of a critical mass which eventually produced a revolutionary explosion, end quote, is appropriate. <laughs> but the, quote, mass can only have been formed by the slow accumulation of all manner of necessary elements, Argue as we may, the long term will always claim its due. End quote. End of footnote. This passage is not entirely helpful. On the one hand, Burdell appears to recognize the importance of identifying the complex linkages between different historical events in order for any complex overall patterns or their absence to be revealed. Yet Burdell gives us little clue as to the nature of the long term process tied to the Industrial Revolution even if we were able to hold it in our heads that this event simultaneously involved both short-term and long-term processes, we are still faced once more with the problem of the term as a referent attached to no specific object or event. So what was or is the Industrial Revolution? Eric Hobsbawm tells us that the term, quote, revolution, end quote, was borrowed from the experience of the French Revolution of 1789 and applied to English experience sometime thereafter, gaining popular usage only around the 1820s. The Industrial Revolution is for Hobsbawm part of a, quote, dual revolution, end quote, industrial in England, political in France. Certainly such upheavals as Luddism, Peterloo, and the swing riots and other social dislocations generated by the economic transformations associated with the Industrial Revolution compelled contemporaries after 1789 to compare these events with the more purely political dislocation associated with the French Revolution. As such, the term picked up the word, quote, revolution through an analogy. Is this accurate? Is this inaccurate? Turning to the dictionary is not helpful. On the one hand, a revolution is, quote, an overthrow or repudiation and a thorough replacement of an established government or political system by people governed, by the people governed, end quote. A definition clearly based on the American and French revolutions of the late 18th century and others which followed, such as the Russian Revolution of 1917. On the other hand, revolution is, quote, a radical and pervasive change in society and the social structure, especially one made suddenly and often accompanied by violence, end quote. And it is also, quote, a sudden, complete, or marked change in something the present revolution in church architecture, end quote. A definition which suggests something more along the lines of the English experience. In other words, a revolution in the mode of social relations of production. It would appear that these two dictionary definitions simply mirror the two very different experiences of political and industrial revolution.
the latter still borrowing the term from the former. While the consequences of the Industrial Revolution were clearly profound, even if these results emerged somewhat gradually by comparison with the sweeping ramifications of the great political revolutions, it appears to be generally accepted that problem with applying the term, quote, revolution, end quote, to this historical event or period is that it is widely viewed as something which traces its origins and antecedents well into the past. Thus taken as a subject, the Industrial Revolution presents any author with an immediate problem. Its origins, causes, and antecedents lay outside and prior to the historical period to which it belongs. Therefore, any effort to explain why the Industrial Revolution happened must account for the period in which these dramatic and revolutionary events took place, but also a long period of events stretching back into the distant past. The demands which this places on the author are immense. There's a footnote I meant to say. There is, of course, the third sense of the term revolution, which means quite the opposite of something, quote, radically new, end quote. And this is the sense of a revolution as something revolving, quote, a procedure or course, as if in a circuit, back to a starting point, end quote, as in an orbit, quote, a cycle of events in time or recurring period of time, end quote. The understanding of the term, quote, revolution, end quote, has always been controversial within Marxist theory. End of footnote. It is a fair question to ask, however, to what process, quote, historical continuum, excuse me, to what precise, quote, historical continuum, end quote, does the Industrial Revolution in Britain belong? It will be a central question of this work that the causes of the Industrial it will be a central contention of this work that the causes of the Industrial Revolution do indeed belong to a long historical evolution, but contrary to the predominant view of Burdell and others who take this historical continuum to be common to Western Europe in general, this evolution can be traced to transformations in the agrarian, social, and class relations of early modern England. Introduction. Who would not, quote, who would not be bewildered by the hundredth debate on this topic, end quote. Fernand Burdell. The significance of the Industrial Revolution as a critical period of transition in human history can hardly be overstated, yet there remains little scholarly agreement on even the most basic issues, should we speak of only one industrial revolution or several? Was the industrial revolution the dawning of the capitalist era or merely the capitalist era's high noon? What were the basic causal factors leading to industrialization? Why was England, Britain after 1707, the first nation to undergo an industrial revolution? These questions have found disparate answers from a wide variety of approaches. The dynamic expansion of industry and technology from the latter half of the 18th century is generally understood across theoretical fences as the logical fulfillment of a prior development of prior developments in trade and economic growth. Many scholars view industrialization as something forever prefigured in the prior development of markets and manufacturing. Indeed, industrialization is treated as a more or less direct response to new opportunities afforded by the dramatic expansion of commerce and the rise in population across Western Europe during the early modern period. It has become virtually axiomatic to assume that these opportunities were always already present in pre-capitalist forms of trade and manufacture. Industrialization, thus, comes about simply through the application of scientific advances to pre-capitalist methods of manufacturing combined with the growth of trade and population, theories which operate based on such assumptions provide us with only a partial and distorted view of history. Such economistic approaches to the Industrial Revolution have generally ignored the role of class and social property relations in shaping and conditioning the process of industrialization, 
As a result, they are unable to explain why industrialization occurred when it did and not in some previous period of commercial and demographic expansion, such as in ancient Rome or China. They are also unable to provide a satisfactory explanation of the relationship between capitalism and industrialization. The definition of, quote, capitalism, end quote, remains subject to widespread ambiguity and sharp divergences of opinion, yet the prevailing view continues to be that capitalism developed across Europe in general, whilst industrialization oddly began in only one country, England. This has led to the general tendency to treat industrialization in relative isolation from considerations of capitalism. In turn, industrialization is often understood as a process driven more by technological advance than by economic considerations, while capitalism itself plays a subordinate role by promoting, quote, economic rationality, end quote, thereby facilitating industrialization. This downplays the historical specificity of capitalism as an economic system operating in real societies in favor of a view of capitalism as an eternal and natural system in continuous development bound up with the advance of science and technology. The pioneering work of Robert Brenner, Ellen Mason's Wood, and George Comnenil, 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 excuse me, George Comnenil, has offered a new approach to questioning, to questions <laughs> arising out of the debate on the transition from feudalism to capitalism. In considering the divergences between the French and English paths out of feudalism, this approach argues that while absolutism was developing in France, the transformation of agrarian social relations in England gave rise to a unique form of social relations, a quote, agrarian crap capitalism, an agrarian, a quote, agrarian capitalism, end quote, understood as a period of transition to industrial capitalism. There is now a significant corpus of work elaborating the theory of English agrarian capitalism. What nevertheless remains to be explained is how agrarian capitalism generated a set of conditions that allowed for incipient industrialization in England. Ellen Mason's Wood has argued that we cannot take for granted that the development of agrarian capitalism made the Industrial Revolution necessary. This is in keeping with her insistence that it is necessary to explicate, explicate historical developments rather than take historical developments causality for granted, quote, whether agrarian capitalism made industrial capitalism not only possible but necessary or inevitable is another question. The conclusion we can draw from the history of agrarian capitalism is that a capitalist dynamic rooted in a new form of social property relations preceded industrialization, both chronologically and causally. In fact, a kind of, quote, market society, end quote, in which the producers were dependent on the market for access to the means of life, labor, and self-reproduction, the subject and subject to market imperatives, was not the result of the industrialization, of industrialization, but industrialization's primary cause. To date, there has been no work focused on demonstrating direct causal linkages between agrarian capitalism and the first industrial revolution. This is the lacuna, which the present study is meant to address. By advancing an account of the Industrial Revolution and its origins, which pays close attention to the importance on the role of class relations, class struggle, and the development of the state in shaping economic outcomes, this study seeks to follow through on radical implications of the challenge to the predominant theories accounting for the origins of capitalism and industrialization posed by Brenner, Wood, and Comnenel. In so doing, the stage is set for future work which could provide a new alternative account of the Industrial Revolution and how it began. Why the Industrial Revolution began in England. The capitalist system in England was brought into being through a transformation in social property relations in which the appropriation of peasant surplus by feudal lords was gradually superseded by a new system of surplus appropriation involving a nexus of powerful landlords renting land to tenant farmers, who in turn hired agrarian wage laborers from a growing pool of cottagers and rural poor. Where peasants had once enjoyed direct possession of the land, a growing number of these direct producers were losing their direct access 
to the means of subsistence and therefore becoming dependent upon market forces for their access to subsistence goods. Simultaneously, their employers also became dependent on markets in land, labor, and money for access to the necessary components of the production process, over which they enjoyed unprecedented control as owners of the means of production. The control gave them exclusive rights to the surplus accruing from that ownership. Rooted in a novel and specifically capitalist system of property relations in the form of profits. In pursuing the extension of this system of surplus appropriation to its logical ends, landlords and tenant farmers were facilitating the expansion of the scope of market regulation of social relations and production decisions. A key aspect of this market regulation was the increasing pressure of market-based competition, which increasingly made the transformation of production an imperative. The expansion of agrarian capitalism was a long and protracted process, however, and landlords and their tenant farmers faced widespread resistance against the loss to the means of subsistence, of access to the means of subsistence, including the wastes and commons. In order for agrarian capitalism to continue to develop, this resistance had to be suppressed. Struggles to resist the imposition of such a system were led principally by direct producers. These struggles were not highly organized as a rule, they were generally sporadic and episodic. They rarely rose to the level of a compact set of ideas forming co a coherent ideological position. They were born directly out of the economic and social pressures, often intense but equally as often protracted, to which direct producers threatened with loss of access to the means of subsistence were subject. Where resistance was organized, it often involved violence against property and occasionally involved violence against persons. Yet such struggles were generally localized. Capitalism was not born in a vacuum any more than it arose out of a democratic form of society. It was the successor to an exploitative manorial system under which, feudal, under which freedom was the preserve of the lords and also of freeholders, while the majority of persons remained both the political and economic subjects of their local lords. From the 16th century onwards, an agrarian capitalism developed. Tenants rose to protest against enclosures. In the 17th century, aspirations for greater freedom and equality were voiced by the levelers, who promoted the idea of universal manhood suffrage and the diggers, a smaller and more radical group who called themselves the, quote, true levelers, end quote, as they advocated the abolition of private property and anticipated theories of communism. Footnote. Thus a digger manifesto reads, quote, as long as we or any other doth own the earth, to be the pe peculiar interest of the lords and landlords, and don't, not common to others as well as them, we own the curse, and holds the creation under bondage. And so long as we, or any other, doth own landlords and tenants, for one to call the land his or another, to hire it of him, or for one to give hire, and for another to work for hire, this is, dis this is to dishonor the work of creation as if the righteous creator should have respect to persons, and therefore made the earth for some and not for all, and that this civil property is the curse, is manifest thus. Those that buy and sell land, and are landlords, have got it either by oppression or murder or theft, and all landlords live in the breach of the seventh and eighth commandments. Thou shalt not steal nor kill. End quote. Note here both the rudiments of an economic analysis of agrarian capitalism, as well as the careful reference to both lords of manorial estates with open fields and landlords leasing out to tenant farmers on enclosed lands. End of footnote. I'm not sure if I'm going to be keep, keep reading the footnotes because this is a huge book and I do actually want to finish it. And if I get bogged down in the details, I might not do so. So, if uh, you want to look at all the footnotes, uh, you got to go buy the book. During the 18th century, freedom of the press expanded enormously. 
but Britain was still a society in which relations of mastery and servitude remained widespread. It is therefore impossible to know for certain how broad the level of popular support was for machine breakers and other protesters. By the third and fourth decades of the 19th century, just as trade unions were growing in strength and number, we witnessed the expression of mass opposition in the form of the Chartist presentation of millions of signatures on petitions to Parliament requesting universal manhood suffrage. Chartism reflected a new mentality, one which sought to expand the political rights of laborers where the struggles over economic rights had been lost. The defeat of Chartism was followed by widespread, but by no means complete, accommodation to capitalism among British workers. Thus the Industrial Revolution owes its pedigree to a series of processes that brought about a transformation of social property relations resulting in widespread market dependence and market regulation of the economy. While this entire process involved class struggle in the form of resistance on the part of direct producers seeking to avoid loss of access to the means of subsistence or loss of control of the labor process and thus required active suppression of such resistance on the part of surplus appropriators, this emphasis on quote active or quote conscious suppression of resistance should not be taken to mean that landlords, tenant farmers, or state policymakers were aware throughout the process that the long-term consequences of their actions would result in a capitalist society and an industrial revolution. It would be absurd to suggest that when English lords set about enclosing their fields between the 15th and 17th centuries, creating land markets and proto-capitalist farms in the process, they had anything approaching contemporary industrial and technological society in mind. It also make little sense to suggest that landlords actually chose to impose market imperatives on themselves and their tenants. While it is true that certain thinkers have been able to articulate an awareness of the broader long-term implications of class struggles, such as the way the participants in the debate at Putney in 1647 demonstrated an awareness of the centrality of property rights to what was essentially an argument between representatives of both the propertied and propertyless classes, class-based actions taken at specific moments in history must be understood in terms of the social and economic pressures that provided the immediate motivation behind them. As the new forms of tenor and social property relations evolved in such a way that even the appropriating classes themselves became market-dependent is unforeseen in unforeseen ways, their own choices were shaped according to how they chose to respond to market imperatives with increasingly which increasingly made economic survival in a competitive market environment contingent upon the ability to transform production. Market dependency, market imperatives, and the social property form of capital, three terms which will be defined more clearly over the course of this study, emerged as the unintended consequences of a long-term process of economic agents pursuing short-term economic ends. While concurring with the prevailing view that the emergence of capitalism predates the first industrial revolution, the present study takes the view that the reason the first industrial revolution took place in Britain is because capitalism first originated in only one country, England. Thus the industrial revolution in Britain was a thoroughly capitalist affair and its history cannot be considered independently of the development of capitalism. If this perspective is correct, why has it not become conventional wisdom? While the Brenner debate is now well established as a wi and widely recognized as a widely recognized contribution to historical social theory, the positions of Brenner, Wood, Comnenel, and others remain a minority position even within Marxist circles. According to Guy Boys, or Guy Boy, Brenner's alleging alleged quote privileging end quote of quote excuse me. According to Guy Boy, Brenner's alleged quote privileging end quote of political factors over economic factors amounts to the heresy of a, quote, political Marxism, end quote. For Ellen Wood, this misses the point of Brenner's method entirely, which is to explore, quote, the consequences of the fusion of the, quote, economic and the, quote, political, the unity of, quote, surplus extracting and, quote, ruling classes, which was precisely a constitutive feature of the feudal mode of production, end quote. How else would Marxist scholarship overcome the error of economism? More broadly, however, we would suggest that there is another reason why this perspective has not been more widely adopted.
in the 18th century, as the Industrial Revolution began to take shape and, and the pace of change quickened, it was becoming increasingly clear to some contemporary observers in Britain that the change around them was leading toward a new social order. If Britain, if British commentators more, were generally more focused upon the clearing away of the older economic forms than the specific nature of the new, this is likely attributable to the fact that agrarian capitalism had already been developing in England for centuries. Adam Smith's treatise, treatise on the wealth of nations is an inquiry into a society that is only very marginally an industrial capitalist society. Smith's work is in point of fact the inquiry par excellence into the economics of the first and only agrarian capitalist society. What is meant by agrarian capitalism will become clear in the chapters that follow. In spite of his brilliance as the founding father of political economy, Smith bequeathed to future generations one major epistemological error that remains embedded like a cornerstone in the foundations of political economy's successor, modern economics. Smith naturalized economics. Smith did this in a peculiar way, however. Quote, in his view, nothing indicates the presence of an economic sphere in society that might become the source of moral law and political obligation. Self-interest merely prompts us to do what, intrinsically, will also benefit others, as the butcher's self-interest will ultimately supply us with dinner. A broad optimism pervades Smith's thinking, since the laws governing the economic part of the universe are, constant, are consonant with man's destiny, as are those that govern the rest. Natural is that which is in accordance with the principles embodied in the mind of man, and the natural order is that which is in accordance with those principles. Nature, in the physical sense, was consciously excluded by Smith from the problem of wealth. Political economy should be a human science. It should deal with that which was natural to man, not to nature. End quote. Karl Polanyi. The distinction between a Smithian economics based on the laws of human nature and the laws of economics being among the laws of nature was lost on later thinkers like Burke and Bentham, for whom the, quote, laws of commerce were the laws of nature and consequently the laws of God, end quote. For them, it was just as well too. quote, let the market be given charge of the poor and things will look after themselves, end quote. Polanyi. To an extent, Bentham and Malthus stand in relation to Smith the way the social Darwinists stand in relation to Darwin. Smith's analysis was never so crude, and he never lacked sympathy for the poor and working classes. In his first treatise, The Theory of Moral Sentiment, Smith wrestled with issues of the corrupting influence of commerce. In short, his solution was to suggest that enlightened men of superior moral virtue, namely the community of country gentlemen leasing their land to capitalist tenant farmers, were in the best position to govern society wisely and uphold the laws, uh, excuse, uphold laws that would keep the otherwise unbridled greed and self-interest of merchants and manufacturers in check. In The Wealth of Nations, Smith carries these themes forward as he advocates an expansion of self-sustaining growth in the context of an agrarian capitalism. It is only because Smith's contemporaries were already familiar with the logic of an economic system driven by competitive markets that the wealth of nations written at the cusp of the Industrial Revolution was properly understood as a description of the agrarian, the agrarian capitalist economy in which they lived, and not, as the text is often misread today, as a blueprint for an industrial capitalist society. To Smith's, Smith's British readers, the concept that the economic laws propelled the British economy forward were eternal and natural would not have seemed the least bit peculiar. It would take a pair of immigrants from Germany to recognize the peculiarities of British capitalism. For Marx and Engels, the rapid transformation of social relations and what was happening to British workers in particular seemed quite unnatural in contrast with the German principalities, which are only just beginning their conversion to capitalism. They saw in capitalism a form of class warfare whose laws were distinctively social. This in turn led them to the project of a writing a critique of political economy.
not only were Smith's followers taken by the notion that economic laws were natural laws, but this understanding promoted a tendency to universalize capitalism because they have never known any other system of economics. Theorists of British political economy were not compelled to inquire into the origins of an economic system, capitalism, that was older than they were. Thus it was that, in their critique of political economy, Marx and Engels criticized the tendency of political economists to project the capitalist mode of production backwards in time to imagine capitalist social relations where they had not existed. In Marx's early attempts to, at, at developing a theory of mo modes of production, he somewhat crit uncritically adopted Smith's episodic view of history of economic systems as one which proceeds a series of, quote, proceeds as a series of, quote, stages, end quote, rather than as a series of complex overlapping processes. As Marx gained a deeper understanding of the specificities of the capitalist system, however, he increasingly emphasized the centrality of production and painstakingly sought to demystify the naturalization of economics by exposing the relations of production as socially and artificially constructed, and therefore subject to change through conscious effort. Despite this increasing emphasis upon social property relations, Marx never took up the project of a systematic historical inquiry into the origins of capitalism. Meanwhile, the followers of Smith, for the followers of Smith, there was simply no inquiry to conduct. For if the laws of capitalism were eternal, then capitalism had no temporal origin. Industrialization and the Industrial Revolution, however, did require an explanation. To date, no single approach to providing such an explanation has achieved general acceptance, and a plethora of authors offer words of warning stating that it is folly to embark upon the task of definitively answering what is arguably the most central historical question in all the social sciences, namely, how did industrial society emerge? It was left to the followers of Marx and Engels' scholarship to initiate a, quote, transition debate, end quote, inquiring into the historical origins of the specific capitalist system of social relations of production and property. The Transition Debate The collection of essays titled The Transition from Feudalism to Capitalism encompasses the key arguments in what has, become, has come to be known as the, quote, transition debate, end quote. Rodney Hilton's introduction begins by mentioning Carl Polanyi's incomplete criticism of Maurice Dobbs' 1946 work entitled Studies in the Development of Capitalism. According to Polanyi, Dobbs had adopted Marx's labor theory of value, which Polanyi considered Marx's weakest theory, in his otherwise excellent attempt to theorize the transition from feudalism to capitalism. Dobbs had ignored Marx's, quote, fundamental insight into the historically limited nature of market organization, end quote. But Polanyi did not pursue the problem, and it was essentially dropped for 30 years until it was picked up by Robert Brenner. Dobbs' work had touched off a debate with fellow Marxist Paul Sweezy in the journal Science and Society in the 1950s. We could identify the three primary points of contention in the, quote, transition debate, end quote, as, one, the definition of a, quote, mode of production, end quote, two, the role of commodity exchange, does trade transform the relations of production? And three, how different developments in England, France, Germany, Italy, and Spain all resulted in capitalism. The third one of these is crucial for anticipating the work of Brenner, who rejected the theory of a single process across Europe in favor of the theory of agrarian capitalism and the argument that England alone gave rise to industrial capitalism. The exchanges between Maurice Dobb and Paul Sweezy are at the center of the debate. Sweezy criticizes Dobb for equating serfdom with feudalism because this does not identify a system of production. He is also critical of Dobb's thesis of the, quote, exhaustion of the peasantry, end quote. Dobb has summarized this thesis as follows, quote, Such evidence as we possess strongly indicates that it was the inefficiency of feudalism as a system of production, coupled with the growing needs of the ruling class for revenue, that was primarily responsible for its decline, 
since this need for additional revenue promoted an increase in the pressure on the producer to a point where this pressure became literally unendurable. End quote. This unendurable pressure reportedly led to A, flight to the towns, and B, insufficient labor on the domains. Sweezy says Dobb is taking too much for granted here, and that basically he does not sufficiently explain how feudalism, as he defines it, gives rise to the towns and the, quote, money, end quote, economy. Quote, Dobb reasons that if the only factor at work in Western Europe had been the rise of trade, the result might as well have been an intensification as a disintegration of feudalism. And from this it follows that there must have been other factors at work to bring about the actually observed result. What were these factors? Dobb believes that they can be found inside the feudal economy itself." End quote. Paul Sweezy. Sweezy disputes Dobb's thesis as follows. He lists four factors which Dobb uses to explain the intensification of lordly demands on the direct producers. The low regard with which ruling classes held for the interests of the serfs, warfare and brigandage, the demographic expansion of the ruling class, and the increasing extravagance of lordly demands. The first two factors are present throughout the period, says Sweezy, and Dobb does not demonstrate how and whether these factors increased in intensity prior to the feudalism's collapse. The growth in size of the exploiting class was real, admits Sweezy, but it was matched by a growth in the size of the peasantry. Moreover, as war took a heavier toll on the upper orders, it is doubtful that the growth of the exploiting classes, in relative terms, was decisive. The fourth factor in Dobbs' thesis, the growing extravagance of their demands, is an acceptable premise for Sweezy, but he argues that this may be understood as an external, not an internal factor. Quote, Once we look outside the feudal system, we find ample reason for the growing extravagance of the feudal ruling class. The rapid expansion of trade from the 11th century onward brought an ever-increasing quantity and variety of goods within its reach." End quote. Finally, Sweezy argues that the hypothesis that serfs would desert the manors in mass is dubious since flight would mean choosing a life of vagrancy and poverty, in which vagrant, and while vagrancy did increase, this was due to there being less room on the manors not to choice. Having thus rebutted Dobbs' main points in explaining the decline of feudalism, Sweezy offers a peculiar alternative. The rise of towns offered liberty, employment, and social status to peasants. And Dobbs' theory of internal causes could be, quote, rescued, Sweezy says, quote, if it could be shown that the rise of the towns was a process internal to the feudal system, end quote. But Dobbs himself recognized that the growth of towns was, quote, in proportion to their importance as trading centers, since trade can in no sense be regarded as a form of feudal economy, it follows that Dobb could hardly argue that the rise of urban life was a consequence of internal feudal causes." End quote. Sweezy takes off from here in proposing that the decline of feudalism can be attributed to external factors, namely the rise of trade. Trade for Sweezy made its impact on the static feudal economy felt in four ways. It revealed the inefficiency of manorial production by supplying goods that could be purchased at a lower cost than they could be made. B. It transformed the attitudes of peasant producers who could now accumulate monetary wealth instead of heaps of perishable goods. C. It developed taste for the feudal ruling. Uh, it developed the taste of the feudal ruling classes, a la Dobb. And D. The rise of towns opened up the prospect for a freer and better life. Relying as he does on changes in prospects, attitudes, and tastes, Sweezy's argument is weak inasmuch as he fails to identify the specific process by which changes took place. What, for example, explains the Lord's access to the means of trade? In other words, their wealth, and why should this be considered limitless? What explains the timing of the breakdown of feudalism? Why did trade not bring about the expected change at an earlier or later period? And most importantly, why would Lord's allow the end of serfdom without an, quote, internal, end quote, class struggle. Justin Rosenberg has since argued persuasively that the Italian city-states in the Middle Ages, being centers of trade and manufacturing which serviced the feudal north, were not transformative of agrarian production, being economically rooted in the circuits of international commerce, and cannot be seen to be the, the precursors to the later rise of national states 
after Westphalia in 1648. Sweezy's conception of, quote, dynamic, end quote, capitalist towns amidst a sea of agrarian stagnation is also counterintuitive when one considers the dynamism of the, quote, agrarian, end quote, feudalism of 1050 to 1300, which saw the populations of England and France more than double, supplying armies for the Crusades, the building of Gothic cathedrals, and the clearing of forests, and the draining of marshes, and the colonization of Eastern Europe by Western European knights who brought peasant settlers with them. As Kahachiro Takahashi, a third participant in the transition debate, points out, external factors themselves must be explained as internal factors to some historical process. Quote, if we say that historical development takes place according to external forces, the question remains, however, how these external forces arose and where they came from. In the last analysis, these forces which manifest themselves externally must be explained internally to history. The dialectics of history cannot go forward without self-movements, the contradictions of inner structure. End quote. Takahashi. Responding to this, Sweezy says he never intended to deny that trade as an external factor was not itself internal to some process. Quote, the expansion of trade with the concomitant growth of towns and markets was external to the feudal mode of production, but it was internal as far as the whole European Mediterranean economy was concerned. End quote. This, possesses a serious, this poses a serious problem regarding the definition of a mode of production. Sweezy appears to be employing it in a very narrow sense of the extractive relations between serfs and lords, or between producers and exploiters, in other words, in, rather economistic, in a rather economistic sense. The notion that there was a feudal mode of production operating somehow independently of circuits of mercantile trade seems to relegate the role of state and ideological and or normative modes of regulating social relations to a separate realm of inquiry. Sweezy sets out the conditions for demonstrating that the growth of towns in feudal Europe was internal to the feudal process. Quote, One would have to show that the feudal ruling class took the initiative in building the towns and successfully integrated them into the feudal system of property and labor relations. Undoubtedly, this did happen in the case of some towns, but it seems as if Piren has conclusively shown that the decisive trading centers typically grew up in an entirely different way, but what particularly indicates the non-feudal character of the towns was the general absence of serfdom." End quote. Sweezy. Sweezy concludes that the driving force of feudalism is to be found outside the system. Dobb responds by saying that he would see the interaction of both internal and external factors as together bringing about historical change rather than seeing the question as one of either or. Dobb places primary emphasis upon internal contradictions, quote, since internal contradictions determine the particular form and direction of the effects which external influences exert, end quote. Trade, in Dobb's view, quote, accentuated the internal conflicts with the old mode of production, end quote. But, quote, external factors... End quote. And Dob Dob seems to accept the rise of the towns as at least in part a quote external end quote factor, cannot determine the specific effect that they will have upon the internal structure of class relations. Thus the effect of the flight to the towns itself due perhaps both to the lure of urban life, as well as quote the repulsive force of feudal extraction, end quote, upon feudal relations would be determined by the specific character of the relationship between serf and feudal lord. The magnitude of flight may have been small, but the threat of it may have, had, may have been sufficient to bring about concessions from lords, thus accelerating the breakdown of feudalism.
Dobb points out that Sweezy's thesis of the rise of trade does not explain, quote, the transition from coercive extraction of labor, surplus labor by estate owners to the use of free hired labor, end quote, which, quote, must have developed upon the existence of cheap labor for hire, i.e. of proletarian or semi-proletarian elements, end quote. For Dobb, this raises the question of what followed feudalism in Europe. As the period of high feudalism ended in the 14th century in Europe, Excuse me. For Dobb, this raises the question of what followed feudalism in Europe. As the high period of high feudalism ended in the 14th century, the next two centuries are apparently suspended between feudalism and capitalism and have to be classified as, quote, homeless hybrids, end quote. Finding this an inadequate def classification, Dobb conjectures that if the ruling class of the period was not bourgeois and capitalist, then the concept of, quote, bourgeois revolution, end quote, would make little sense since the bourgeoisie would itself already have been in power by either 1640 or 1789. Either the, the events of these years were court and crown attempts at counter-revolution, or we must dispense with the concept of bourgeois revolution altogether. Finding neither alternative agreeable, Dobb proposes that the ruling class remained feudal because it continued to depend upon the exploitation of producers following the petty mode of production, a, quote, feudal, end quote, mode of production. By this logic, having come to the conclusion that the ruling classes of the intervening period between feudalism and capitalism remained feudal, Dobb then seeks the source of capitalism in the rising class of, quote, kulak, end quote, yeoman farmers, whom he sees as, quote, key to understanding the class alignment of the bourgeois revolution, end quote, of 17th century England. We will see shortly how Brenner found this part of Dobbs' analysis problematic. Neither Dobb nor Sweezy appears to recognize the specificity of feudalism as distinguished from the manorialism that followed the collapse of the Roman Empire, or how the introduction of what was arguably the most highly regulated system of production in history on the seigneuries or seigneuries formed the basis for what, by the standards of the time, was an explosion of agrarian production and subsequent population growth. Takahashi's important if problematic contributions to the debate Although theoretically amounting mostly to a restatement of some of Dobbs' major points, point to some of the problems which would become central for Brenner's later work. Most notably, Takahashi points out divergences between England, France, and Eastern Europe, in particular following Tani. Takahashi points out the peculiar, peculiarity of the English development of the, quote, tripartite division into landlord, capitalist farmer, and landless agricultural laborer, end quote which is this characteristic of modern English agriculture, end quote, and which because it, quote, had its origins within structure, within the structure of already existing English feudal society, there is no reason to ascribe it to trade as such, end quote. Takahashi also notes the absence of these developments in France. He mentions the writings of Arthur Young, who in his travels in France noted the miserable conditions of the French peasantry prior, prior to 1789. Takahashi comments that the dissolution of the small peasant producers in France, quote, did not establish a capitalist wage labor system, but initiated usurious land proprietorship, end quote. Takahashi still amalgamates the English and French experiences together under the rubric of Marx's, quote, way one, end quote. 
which is the transformation of the small producer into a capitalist by his gaining control over the productive process. Thus, the, quote, class of small and middle-scale industrial and commercial capitalists threaded their way to independence in the interstices of the merchant capitalist, quote, control, end quote, and became the merchant manufacturers, end quote. Takahashi adds that Dobbs should have, quote, given a more precise development, end quote, to his theory of way one, or the, quote, truly revolutionary way, end quote, quote, in light of the internal organization peculiar to English agriculture, end quote. Rather than following this up by integrating further the differences between the English and French experiences, however, Takahashi distinguishes the English, French, Western European experience from the Eastern European route to capitalism. The former are held to have followed way one, while the latter followed, quote, way two, end quote, or the merchant becoming a capitalist through the putting out system, whereby the small producers were subordinated to market forces by merchants controlling the small producers' access to the market. Both Dobb and Takahashi, contra Sweezy, look for the dynamic of the system, not in the relations between producers and the market, but in the relations between producers themselves, between producers and their exploiters. Rejecting Sweezy's understanding of capitalism as distinguished from feudalism in terms of a system of production of ex for exchange versus a system of production organized primarily for use values, the rise of capitalism as simply the growth and eventual predominance of production for exchange. Dobb attempts to locate the agent of change in their social production relations, the agents of change in their social production relations, but in a very limited manner. Way one and way two are taken as general paths to the capitalism. To cap, uh, way one and way two are taken as general paths to capitalism operating across feudal Europe, or post-feudal Europe, depending on how it is defined. The process may vary widely in content, but as a rule, each begins with a fairly generic feudalism, and ends in the same result: a process of accumulation of capital through the subordination and control of landless free wage labor. Aside from recognizing England's precocious industrial development, the peculiarity of the English experience is not dealt with. Moreover, the subordination and commodification of labor is assumed as a fairly natural result of the growth of a capitalist class, which can impose capitalist conditions upon the entire country once it has broken the, quote, fetters, end quote, of feudalism by overthrowing the feudal aristocracy in bourgeois revolution. However, the notion that bourgeois revolution represents the final and ultimate blow to the old structure of class relations, ushering in the new capitalist system in one breathtaking moment, appears to simply reproduce Sweezy's explanation of the triumph of a system of exchange values over one use value. For although Dobb managed to pose the problem of the process by which the economics is separated from the political and capitalism by emphasizing the, quote, extra economic, end quote, character of feudal relations, the process is assumed, not explained, in the triumph of the bourgeois slash proletarian capitalist class system over the lord slash peasant feudal class system. The bourgeoisie becomes, in effect, the social agent which can institute a system of production for exchange and quash the former system of production for use values. <laughs> Brenner credits Dobb for being perhaps the first to, quote, begin to understand feudalism in terms of feudalism's own internal contradictions and conflicts, not excluding but important incorporating the growth of trade, end quote. But providing a theory of feudal economic development in crisis is not to provide a full account of the transition to capitalism. Dobb accounts for the transition in terms of the, quote, unfettering, end quote, of petty commodity production. Here, however, the attempt to formulate a theory of transition to capitalism for Western Europe as a whole runs into trouble. For Dobb, quote, understates the pivotal, pivotal role played by English landlords in short-circuiting and undercutting small peasant production so as to provide the conditions for capitalist development 
by their commercial tenants, end quote. Brenner. Dobb is hard-pressed to explain how, quote, feudalism, end quote, was overthrown in 1640, how the, quote, fetters, end quote, of feudalism had impeded capitalist development up to that point. And moreover, to demonstrate that there existed in England in 1640 any, quote, feudal, end quote, ruling class at all. In rejecting trade as the external source of dynamism within feudalism, Dobb proceeded to an analysis of the feudal laws of motion. Dobb recognized that feudal class relations, quote, generated their own long-term development tendencies toward retrogression, end quote. The crisis of the 14th century was the realization of these tendencies. The result being a drastic reduction in population and subsequently a crisis in seigneurial revenues. I should really make sure I'm pronouncing that word right, so I'll have to look that up on my, before my next recording. Uh, the, new available, the newly available untenanted land and scarcity of labor opened the way for the peasantry to throw off lordly controls. Dobb is clear on this and on all of this, says Brenner, but he does not draw the logical conclusion. At first, he seems to suggest that the crisis of the 14th century itself determined the fall of serfdom, rather than resulting from a process of class struggle. Later, he examines the seigneurial reaction, post-collapse, and also, oh, excuse me, and asks why in some regions feudal rent was maintained whilst elsewhere, specifically England, lords were, quote, unable to prevent the supersession of serfdom by the rise of contractual relations between lord and pre peasant or even the rise of peasant property, end quote. Strangely, Dobb comes to the following conclusion, quote, All the indications suggest that in deciding the outcome, ec outcome, economic factors must have exercised the outstanding influence, end quote. <coughs> Dobb. Here Brenner objects, quote, Was not the essence of feudalism as Dobb defines feudalism, the encasement of economic productive activities within a, det a determined structure of extra economic relations of surplus extraction directed by force, end quote. The implication of Dobbs, quote, economic, end quote, argument, says Brenner, appears to be that the lords could dictate whatever outcome was suitable to their needs. Dobb failed to carry through this in his inquiry into the sources of class solidarity and class power among the peasantry, among the lords, among the lords. Instead, Dobb continued to rely on the assumption that once serfdom was abolished, peasant production will evolve. <laughs> Quote, more or less automatically in the direction of capitalism, under the impact of the market, pet, larger petty producers will accumulate surpluses. Their size will give them technical advantages over smaller plots. They'll ultimately outcompete the smaller units on the market. The outcome is a bit by bit takeover by the larger producers from the smaller ones. The, evo the elevation of the larger producers into the ranks of rural capitalists and the depression of the smaller ones into the rank of wage laborers. Nevertheless, to assume such a progression is to beg the central question, for it is to assume that there already exist social productive relations in which the petty producers are deprived of the means of subsistence, so that the petty producers must sell in the market and productively compete in order to survive. End quote. Brenner, 1978. Brenner contrasts the ability on the part of much of the French peasantry to hold on to the land and the apparent absence of any dispossession of peasants by market forces with Valene peasants in England, who were unable to establish widespread proprietorship and were vulnerable to the supersession by larger producers who held leases from landlords. In England, the impact of the market did indeed condition a significant pattern of differentiation. It is, this argues Brenner, it is this, argues Brenner, which must be explained and which cannot be assumed. The separation of the direct producers from the means of production and the direct producers' vulnerability to the productive competition according to market principles. Footnote. 
Brenner notes that Dobb did not neglect Marx's discussion of so-called primitive accumulation, and neither did Dobb neglect the role of landlords. Dobb merely fails to link these insights into his discussion of the, dis of the transition and bourgeois revolution. <laughs> Must be something in the air today, and very aller allergenic. Marx on property relations, Brenner's point of departure. Adam Smith captured the essence of economic growth and discovered its key mechanism, namely, quote, the presence in the economy of a systematic and continuous tendency or drive to transform production in the direction of greater efficiency, end quote. Adam Smith. This drive entails specialized production for exchange on a competitive basis, which presupposes market dependence and a system of consistently seeking ways of reducing the price-slash-cost ratio of output, which in turn requires further specialization, the accumulation of surpluses and innovation, or the adoption of the best available production techniques. For Smith, this whole system is premised upon the natural human tendency for individuals to pursue their rational self-interest through exchange. What Smith fails to specify are the social conditions under which the commodification of all factors of production is both possible and relational in the eyes of the economic agents themselves. Smith assumes the existence of free economic actors who are not subject to extra economic constraints and also assumes that rational self-interest precludes any attempts to maintain non-capitalist systems of production. Sweezy, according to Brenner, adopts the same problematic assumptions. Like Smith, Sweezy locates the source of the transformation in psychological factors, specifically the pursuit of rational self-interest. Thus, Lords adopted a, quote, exchange consciousness, end quote, and merchants and members of the feudal system alike adopted a, quote, business-like attitude. In effect, capitalism always exists for Sweezy. It is merely inhibited by the feudal integument. Sweezy posits that the relationship of direct producers to the market determines their operation, their development, and their relation to each other and not vice versa. So like Smith, he locates the potential for development in the capacities of the system's component and isolated units, not in the system as a whole. Like Smith, Sweezy contrasts production for exchange versus production for use, but he does not ask under what conditions is exchange value able to predominate. For Marx, the domination of exchange value itself and production which generates exchange value, quote, presupposes alien labor capacity itself as an exchange value i.e. the separation of living labor capacity from its objective conditions, a relation to them or to its own objectivity as alien property, a relation to them and the word as capital. Only in the period of the decline and fall of the feudal system, but where it still struggles internally, as in England in the 14th and first half of the 15th centuries, is there a golden age for labor in the process of becoming emancipated. End quote. Marx. <laughs> it is this emancipation or freeing of labor from labor's objective conditions of existence which for Marx enables money wealth to become capital. For money wealth accumulates both the means of production on the one hand and on the other hand purchases labor power on a regular and ever-expanding basis, thereby subsuming production to its control and its own prerequisites of specialization, maximization, and innovation in order to compete on the marketplace. Marx identifies the starting point of the wage laborer and the capitalist as, quote, the servitude of the labor, end quote, which in the transition to capitalism undergoes a change in form, a transformation from feudal exploitation to capitalist exploitation. Marx writes, quote, Although we come across the first beginnings of capitalist production, as early as the 14th or 15th centuries, 
sporadically in certain towns of the Mediterranean. The capitalistic era dates from the 16th century, end quote. Marx. <laughs> Note the use of the term, quote, capitalistic, end quote, in the latter half of this sentence, contrasting with, quote, capitalist production, end quote, in the earlier part. This suggests ambiguity on Marx's part regarding the nature of capitalism prior to the Industrial Revolution and its precursor in England, the expropriation of the agricultural producers. Since Marx writes of, quote, merchant capital, end quote, in the early modern period, he is obliged, at least, to speak of forms that are, quote, capitalistic in this period. But by identifying, quote, capitalist production, end quote, in Italian manufactures in the 16th century, Marx appears to contradict himself. He means to imply that capital as a social relation, the precise object which his case study sets out to define, can be identified in 16th century Italy. For in the next paragraph, he identifies the revolutionary moments of primitive accumulation as, quote, above all, those moments when great masses of men are suddenly and forcibly torn from their means of subsistence and hurled as free and, and quote, unattached, end quote, proletarians on the labor market, end quote. <laughs> Continuing, he writes, quote, The expropriation of the agricultural producer, of the peasant, from the soil, is the basis of the whole process. The history of this expropriation in different countries assumes different aspects and runs through its various phases in orders of succession and at different periods. In England alone, we take as our example, has it the classic form, end quote. Marx. Continuing further in a footnote, Marx notes that the emancipation of serfs first happened in Italy and, quote, at once transformed him, the serf, into a free proletarian, who moreover found his master ready, waiting for him in the towns, end quote. The use of the term, quote, master, end quote, here is telling. For Marx's, quote, proletariat, end quote, is not heading for work in a factory, but in a manufacturing workshop, regulated by custom, and as such the use of the term, quote, free proletarian, end quote, appears misleading. Footnote. In the next chapter, we will discuss how, in a different context, Epstein also equates wage labor with capitalist production. Interestingly, Marx goes on to explain when the Northern Italy commercial supremacy, when Northern Italy commercial supremacy was annihilated by around 1500, deurbanization ensued. <laughs> The reader could conjecture that this explains why no industrial revolution followed in Italy. End of footnote. Despite being a prominent critic of Smith, Marx initially adopted the, the essentials of Smith's theory of the division of labor as the source of capitalist development. However, Marx went on to develop a theory of modes of production, which provided him with a pre powerful point of departure from which to begin the critique of Smith's synchronic and ahistorical model. In theorizing feudalism and capitalism as modes of production, Marx sought to explain how capitalism developed out of the action of feudal society itself. In particular, Marx hoped to explain how extra-economic surplus appropriation, through rent and other forms of tribute, was dissolved, and how the separation of the direct producers from the means of production was brought about. Brenner Brenner argues that Marx's original formulation of the transition to capitalism, which relied heavily on the concept of bourgeois revolution, was explicitly techno-functionalist, end quote. While the later Marx focused on class and property relations and connection between these relations to the process of development, class structure in Marx's early formulations depended on the occupational position of individuals in, quote, technically constituted roles in the labor process, end quote. Class and property relations are taken as mere appendages of the division of labor. Marx had only elaborated, not broken with Smith's theory. In his later writings, Marx defined property relations as both the relations between direct producers and the means of production, and the relations between the direct producers themselves. Both sets of relations structure the actions of direct producers in a way that allows direct producers to reproduce themselves as agents within a rule-bound system, at the same time as the direct producers reproduce the whole structure 
of social production relations, including the property relations which govern the system. Marx now recognized that the structure of property relations, which is reproduced on a consistent on a constant basis by the community, quote, constituted a fundamental constraint under which economic actors chose their economic goals and in turn decided just how they would respond to the emerging opportunities for exchange that had played such a determining role in the first Smithian version of Marx's historical materialism, end quote. Robert Brenner, 1989. This new approach turned Marx's earlier approach upside down. Instead of the forces of production determining the structure of production relations through the division of labor within the workplace, the structure of property relations bound up as it is with the entire structure of social relations and the specific form of the state in a class society govern the overall direction of economic change. Brenner takes this conception of the role of property relations in social change, a conception held by the quote mature end quote Marx, as the basis for his understanding of feudalism. Central to Brenner's understanding was the fact that peasant producers and the peasant producers overlords in pre-capitalist societies had direct access to the means of production. In the process of choosing their fundamental economic goals, the primary interest of the peasant would be to maintain access to the plot of land which that peasant possessed. Since maintaining access to the plot of land was the basis of the means of the peasant and the peasant's family's subsistence. Footnote. This is assuming the average peasant head of household to be male and thus the use of, quote, he, quote, him, and such like. A minority of peasant holders were, of course, headed by widows, unmarried women, and so on. End of footnote. To do this, the peasant would have to maintain his standing in the village community since the community mediated his relationship to the land. In short, it was in the peasant's interest to reproduce himself as a peasant. Moreover, given the uncertainty of harvest and the subsequent uncertainty in food supplied through the market, it would not be in the peasant's, quote, rational self-interest, end quote, to preserve production for the market. Specialization in a given crop can spell disaster in the event of crop failure, or a sharp decline in price due to a general glut of the produ that product on the market. It was therefore sensible for peasants to avoid dependence on access to subsistence goods through the market, or on the sale of commercial crops at the market as means of generating subsistence revenue. <laughs> subsistence could best be guaranteed through diversifying production, so a maximum number of needs could be provided for through non-market means. Going to market with non-essential surpluses, if possible, and if necessary, could be done to fill in when this strategy resulted in a shortfall in the fulfillment of specific needs, or to obtain petty luxury goods if subsistence needs were met. Brenner. Lords, too, in pre-capitalist societies enjoyed direct access to their means of production, ownership of land worked by peasants, as well as ownership of the means of coercion in the form of military equipment and demand power, what Brenner refers to as, quote, politico-military apparatuses, end quote. Lords were thus free, quote, from the necessity of increasing their income for the purpose of increasing their productive capacity, end quote. To increase their incomes, lords had to coerce peasants into yielding a greater share of their surplus. For lords to pursue a strategy of improving the productivity of agriculture, lords would have been required to employ overseers engaged in the direct supervision of the labor process, which would prove costly. They could not expropriate peasants from the land because peasant access to land was regulated by customary law which bound lords and peasants in a web of mutual obligations. Moreover, there was no class of free producers devoid of the means of reproduction to whom they could lease out their land or hire on a wage-labor basis. The most rational and efficient avenue for lords to increase their consumption was to accumulate surpluses which they could invest in the means of coercion for use in guaranteeing and maximizing their share of peasant surpluses, 
as well as for going to war and expanding their estates by colonizing new lands. For these reasons, neither lords nor peasants in pre-capitalist societies depended on the market for their subsistence, and neither would find it rational to become market dependent. The pressures to engage in systematic specialization, maximization of price-cost ratios, and innovation in the productive process were simply not present. A fundamental er barrier to the drive to systematically improve the efficiency of production was posed by the access which the direct producers had to the means of production in land. The factors of production, peasants' labor, land, and insofar as peasants produced their own implements, remain effectively outside the circuit of commodity exchange. To the extent that merchants played a role in pre-capitalist economic systems, it was on one of maintaining, not transforming the system. Merchants prof profited through pursuing trade, not investing in ever more productive spheres of production. Building on Polanyi's observation that the character of trade before the advent of what Polanyi calls, quote, market society, end quote, was fundamentally non-competitive. Wood points out that buying cheap and selling dear was the operative principle, not market-driven competition. To the extent that competition within the marketplace existed, it was not driven by, quote, producing more cost-effectively, end quote, but had more to do with achieving dominance over trade routes or arbitrage between markets. <laughs> I believe arbitrage means uh, buying in one place cheap and then selling uh, at a higher cost somewhere else, and that's making a profit from the difference as opposed to making a profit through uh, the investment in uh, labor power and then uh, taking the proceeds of that labor power uh, in the form of surplus value. Um, don't feel like I quite worded that correctly, but whatever. No one wants to hear what I think. Anyway, that's what I think arbitrage is. Where am I? Quote, this kind of trade largely in luxury goods for a fairly limited market did not in itself carry any impulse to improve productivity. The main vocation of the large merchant was circulation rather than production, end quote. Communal regulation of production both in the peasant villages and urban guilds predominated not individual discretion. Only a radical restructuring of property and class relations could change this. The role of merchants was to secure the trade of urban handicraft production in luxury and military goods for lordly consumption in exchange for peasant-produced food and raw materials needed in the towns for the artisans' subsistence. <laughs> in order to ensure that they could buy cheap and sell dear, merchants sought and obtained the ability to control access to their markets. Gaining monopoly control over markets required political assistance, and thus cultivation of alliances with the monarch or the lordly class was a major preoccupation of the merchant. Quote, from far from transforming the old system economically or subverting it politically, the merchant class thus tended to live off the old socio-economic socio order and to constitute one of its main bulwarks, end quote. Marx thought that commerce had a generally corrosive effect upon production because under the influence of commerce, production increasingly becomes production for exchange value and products increasingly take on the character of commodities. But it is centrally important to note that Marx is unequivocal about the fact that merchant capital cannot by itself explain the transition to capitalism and that commercial change, economic growth, or decline does not determine the outcome of the process of social change. Marx wrote, quote, to what extent commerce brings about a dissolution of the old mode of production depends on bracket the old modes and bracket solidity and the internal structure and whither the process will lead what new mode of production will replace the old does not depend on commerce but on the character of the old mode of production itself end quote <laughs> This is a mode of pr production involved, thus a mode of production involved a particular, quote, solidity, solidity and internal structure, end quote, of the system of property relations, which governs the social relations of production, which gives it its distinctive character. <laughs> 
In this way, Marx distinguished various pre-capitalist modes of production by their distinctive forms of property relations. Marx's theory of modes of production posed the, posed the problem of the transition in a new way, that being how pre-capitalist property relations were transformed into capitalist property relations. Brenner takes Marx's theory and elaborates a causal sequence for changes in economic development. He argues that the form of property relations set the rules for reproduction of the individual economic actors, and the carrying out of these rules will result in aggregate in the long-term pattern of economic development or non-development. Given societies with diverging structures of property relations, then, the same demographic and commercial changes may develop along entirely different paths. Brenner locates the divergence that led to the transition to capitalism in English agrarian property relations. The Specificity of Capitalism and Agrarian Capitalism both Ellen Mason's Wood and George Comnenel have credited Karl Polanyi for recognizing the strikingly disruptive character of the self-regulating market under capitalism. No one, writes Comnenel, quote, has yet spelled out more clearly than Polanyi how truly peculiar it is for a society to have its fundamental processes of social reproduction organized in the manner of capitalism, end quote. Comnenel adds, quote, what Polanyi particularly, particularly denies is that there ever was a society prior to capitalism in which the market played a role comparable to the market's absolutely central role in capitalist society, end quote. Wood recognizes that Polanyi was indeed has indeed broken with the standard accounts of economic development inasmuch as the standard accounts of economic development stress the continuity of commercial activity from ancient times to the present. Polanyi's understanding of the development of capitalism, however, writes Wood, is based on a belief that technological process lay at the heart of it. In effect, Polanyi remains an economic and a technological determinist. Quote, Polanyi never actually treats the market itself as a social relation, as, a distinct, as distinct from an impersonal mechanism which imposes itself on social relations, end quote. In contrast to Polanyi's technological determinism, Wood offers an alternative by proposing, as we read in an earlier quote from Wood, that a, quote, market society, end quote, in which both direct producers and exploiters had become, or were in the process of becoming, dependent upon the market for access to the means of subsistence and of self-reproduction, not only preceded industrialization, but served as industrialization's primary cause, end quote. Or, excuse me, quote. Not end quote. The quote is starting, not ending. <laughs> quote. Only a transformation in social property relations, which compelled people to produce competitively and not just to buy cheap and sell dear, a transformation which made access to the means of production dependent on the market, can explain the dramatic revolutionizing of productive forces uniquely characteristic of modern capitalism. End quote. Here we see why the theory of agrarian capitalism represents such a sharp departure from long-standing taken-for-granted assumptions about the development of capitalism. The overwhelming tendency has been to equate trade and or wage labor in whatever form with capitalism, and thus to equate the growth of trade and or wage labor with the growth of capitalism itself. Footnote. As previously noted, although Marx broke with this conception, he tended to equate the expansion of wage labor with capitalism without analyzing the specific structures of property relations involved. Without the analytical tool of market dependency, one cannot show how producers enter a capitalist dynamic when producers are subject to market compulsion and are subject to a process, the result of which is the commodification of labor power. End of footnote. The transition debate brought, about the peculiarly, brought out the peculiarity of feudal and pre-industrial English developments, the backwardness of French 
agriculture relative to agrarian capitalism in England, and the importance of peasant-slash-lord relations in the decline of feudalism and the rise of capitalism. We have just seen that in his later work, Marx revised his earlier Smithian formulations and recognized the historical specificity of different modes of production, capitalism among those different modes of production. By virtue of those modes of production's distinct systems of property relations, Furthermore, Marx recognized the importance of the expropriation of the agricultural population from the land, the, quote, bloody legislation, end quote, against the agrarian population, the, quote, classic form, end quote, of which took place in England. Yet Marx, Dobb, and Sweezy all left unexplained what most needed to be explained, which is the actual historical process by which the direct producers become divorced from the means of production, thereby creating a proletariat and the conditions of it for industrialization. Through this process, all the agents of production become, became market dependent, where before the agents of production had access to the means of subsistence outside of or prior to the agents of production's relationship to the market. Through this process, the production of the market ceased to be merely an option or opportunity. The process of production for the market became instead a system with, quote, specific laws of motion that uniquely compel people to enter the market, to reinvest surpluses, and to produce, quote, efficiently, end quote, by improving labor productivity, the laws of competition, maximization, and capital accumulation, end quote. Ellen Mason's Wood. It should be clear, then, that the task at hand is to locate the logic of this process. To this end, the theory of agrarian capitalism has provided a beginning. The theory attempts to locate a rupture in the feudal system of property relations, which opened up a unique historical opportunity for the development of a capitalist system of property relations. A necessary precondition for the development of agrarian capitalism in England was the decline of serfdom and feudal relations of direct domination by around 1450. The decline of feudalism was not caused by English agrarian capitalism, as this decline occurred broadly across Western Europe. Nor did the decline of serfdom mean the simultaneous rise of capitalism or capitalist forms of production. In Western Europe, new forms of state surplus extraction were developed through the centralization of the state and the transformation of state offices into a new form of property, the tax state office, a development that Wood, following Perry Anderson, has aptly described as the, quote, centralization upwards, end quote, of feudal estate property. Wood. Eastern Europe experienced a second serfdom, lasting into the 19th century. The Italian city-states lapsed into lordly somnambulism and forever lost the vibrancy the Italian city-states previously enjoyed as Republican communes serving as the hub of access to international commerce for the feudal north. Meanwhile, English property relations were undergoing a different kind of transformation. The different paths out of feudalism shared many features in common, such as the expansion of commercial activity or the centralization of military force by the state. But contrary to deep-seated assumptions about human nature and economic evolution, there was no capitalism just waiting to be set free from the, quote, fetters, end quote, of feudalism. The process by which capitalism came into being begins in England. The English body politic had, since the Norman conquest, been more cohesive and more unified than most countries in Europe. By the 14th century, land ownership in England was peculiarly concentrated in the hands of larger lords, and in general, the reserve the reserves that were the direct property of the lords in England were larger in comparison with the holdings of their counterparts on the continent. Ellen Wood suggests that there was a kind of trade-off where lords accepted the centralization of state power in exchange for control over the land, becoming land lords in the process. In the, con in the context of a loss of over half the population after the plagues, Lords engrossed vacant lands and lands held by formerly the lane tenants, 
in many cases converting the latter to leaseholds. To do this, lords turned the common law, unique to England, to their advantage in asserting their rights to land as a form of personal property rather than as something the lords held legal jurisdiction over by virtue of their enfeoffment as barons. Commonel. Between 1370 and 1470, lords began to lease out their manorial domains to tenants rather than allowing peasant proprietors to cultivate them. Directly, for many lords, the income from leased land soon eclipsed the income from those still regulated by customary rights, and in this way, by adapting the king's law to promote their interests, they gradually began to transform themselves from manorial lords into landlords. Hilton Brenner. Hilton and Brenner. The different classes of tenants, freeholders, copyholders, and tenants at will, were still present, but this system, quote, was in many ways being bypassed, end quote, as freeholders and copyholders, for example, let out lands to subtenants, quote, whose existence was not in the cognizance of the manorial system, end quote. Coleman. Relying increasingly on economic rents enforced by contract under common law, rather than extra economic power, England's landed aristocracy was the earliest in Europe to demilitarize. By itself, this increasing reliance on economic rents did not constitute the beginning of an agrarian capitalism, because production was still organized according to non-market extra-economic rules or customary modes of production. Only when significant tracts of land were removed from the purview of customary law through enclosure did the capital relation make its first appearance. In the late 15th century, the elevated arable lands of, the east, of eastern Yorkshire were widely enclosed for the purpose of creating sheep runs. While pastures had been created elsewhere, the creation of these sheep runs in eastern Yorkshire was the beginning of a new pattern of converting land from arable to pasture when the price of wool and mutton was high. In Yorkshire Wolds region, in the Yorkshire Wolds region, both high and low lands were heavily manorialized with strong open field systems, but only the high wolds, where the quantity of the land where the quality of the land was poor, were enclosed every early for pasture, provoking a tremendous outcry from local tenants. The lowlands were among the last arable lands in England to be enclosed by parliamentary enclosure. Oh shit, I missed a fit footnote. Footnote. The term, quote, customary modes of production, end quote, is used here cautiously, not in order to collapse distinctions between various non-capitalist economies with entirely different histories and laws of operation, but as a way of drawing a very broad distinction between economies still very much, quote, embedded, end quote, in social and political relations and capitalism, in which the economy, in theory to a considerable degree in practice, has become, quote, disembodied, end quote, from extra economic forms of regulation. End of footnote. When grain prices recovered, there was a significant return to mixed farming after the original enclosure for pasture. Thus, quote, improved, end quote, agriculture involving mixed or, quote, sheep and corn, end quote, farming, was introduced. What this example suggests is that the conversion of arable pasture through enclosure on the high wolds was being made not in accordance with local manorial custom, but in direct response to market prices. While other regions saw enclosure of arable for conversion to pasture, the transformation was less dramatic owing to the weakness of the field systems relative to East Yorkshire. In the context of an argument of social production relations, where the right to property was absolute and, the pro and production decisions could be made in accordance with the market, leasehold tenor took on a new character, for now individual leaseholders were in competition with other tenants, not only in the search for paying customers to buy their produce, 
but most importantly for security of tenor in the form of leases. Failure to pay the rent on a lease spelled dispossession. In this increasingly competitive environment, production for the market became less and less about realizing the opportunity afforded by the market to dispose of a surplus in order to earn additional income, and more and more about copy or about Jesus Christ, and more and more about coping with the imperative to compete by increasing overall output on a tenancy, an imperative imposed on tenant farmers by a competitive market in leases. Ultimately, this would mean specializing in cash-bearing crops and innovating in production methods and technologies. What began to emerge was a sphere of social relations increasingly governed by market regulation, as opposed to direct domination or, quote, extra economic, end quote, coercion. It only, quote, began, end quote, to emerge here because this, quote, strictly economic, end quote, sphere of social relations first developed in the context of social relations, which retained many of the basic characteristics of feudalism, including both lordly and royal hierarchies. Social relations in general were still subject to normative regulation through custom and convention. We are only at the beginning of a process by which the sphere of the economy governed by market regulation through competitive pressures expanded at the expense of normative customary systems of socioeconomic regulation. Footnote. The evolutionary process is not complete even today. Polanyi argued that a truly free market society would annihilate itself and that for this reason the state had to play a role to quote buffer end quote the effects of the free market. Thus a fully fledged or fully developed capitalism one in which all social relations came to be regulated by the market, could never come into existence. Despite this, followers of the Japanese Marxist theory, Kozo, oh, excuse me, followers of the Japanese Marxist theorist Kozo Uno's work, such as Robert Albritton, have adopted the approach that the best way to understand capitalism is to engage in, quote, pure theory, end quote, that is, to theorize in the abstract a purely capitalist society in which all social relations are regulated by the market. For a critique of pure theory, see Zmolik, 2004. This would entail many conflicts in the process of transformation. Typically, the process by which, quote, feudal, end quote, systems of property relations are dismantled is understood as the, quote, unfettering, end quote, of, quote, obstacles, end quote, to capitalist development, as though capitalism were ever present in human nature, in the form of rationality, technological development, and or commerce. But here, we are tracing the point of rupture of the old system and the beginnings of something completely different, capitalism. And the amazing thing about capitalism an economic system which promotes the regulation of production according to the dictates of the market ahead of all other forms of regulation is that capitalism developed out of feudalism, an economic system which production was intensively regulated according to extra economic rules and norms. Since capitalism did not develop in Asia or ancient Europe, it would appear that capitalism needed something to push against that the repudiation of normative economic regulation was more likely to take place under conditions of intense normative control. Footnote. This concept of capitalism as owing its origins, at least in part, to a rejection of the intensive normative regulation under feudalism arises out of personal discussions with Professor George Comnenel and are based upon his research into the question of whether feudalism could be considered a mode of production. Therefore, these comments anticipate his as yet published, his as yet unpublished work. Additionally, the use of the term, quote, normative, end quote, here and throughout this work is not intended to stress morality or ethics, as, it sometimes, as is sometimes the case in political theory, but is rather intended in its more anthropological usage and is used by Polanyi to refer to, quote, economic, end quote, relations directly governed by social conventions, mores, and customs, typically of a local origin. This will become more explicit, this will become more explicit as the work progresses, especially in chapter 10.
market dependency. What was unprecedented about agrarian capitalism is that as the system developed, the economic agents involved become increasingly dependent on the market in order to obtain the necessities of life. The development of market dependency is much more clearly evident in the wake of the enclosure movement. High prices for animal products in the late 15th and early 16th centuries prompted a wave of enclosures in regions more suitable for husbandry. But with the great rise of grain prices by the late 16th and early 17th centuries, enclosures were increasingly undertaken on arable lands, with their income increasingly derived from economic rents. Enclosure offered landlords a method by which landlords could extinguish customary rights and rid themselves of copyholding tenants whose status was protected under the customary law of the manor. The act of erecting fences or planting hedges around a field, both symbolically and literally, removed the land in question from the jurisdiction of customary law, canceling customary obligations attached to the land and making the land a piece of property or, quote, real estate, end quote, protected exclusively by common law. Prior to this, footnote, prior to this, the lordly property was protected under common law, but only in accordance with the dictates of customary law. Brenner has argued, and a footnote, Brenner has argued that the development of a, quote, agrarian capitalism, end quote, in England, set and trained the long-term logic of self-sustaining growth which Adam Smith identified as a progressive element in capitalism. The development moved, the development, Jesus Christ, the development involved the conversion of the direct producers from peasants into landless poor, or semi-proletarians increasingly dependent upon the sale of their labor power for their subsistence. As agrarian capitalism developed, both producers and the producers' exploiters became subject to a situation of market dependence, for the exploiting class also became subject to market pressures that compelled them to maximize their productive output by innovating in productive techniques or by specializing in a narrow range of commodities. In order to reproduce themselves as they were, they now had to rely on market exchange. This new logic or set of rules of the market as imperative contrasted sharply, as Ellen Mason's Wood has pointed out, with the pre-capitalist feudal logic of the market as opportunity. Peasant production on the manorial estate was primarily geared towards consumption for subsistence. After the fall of the Roman Empire, the manorialism that prevailed across most of Europe involved little, more, little marketing of agrarian surpluses. But the advent of feudalism after 900 Common Era introduced a new and complex medieval field system and an enormous increase in the number of fines, fees, rents, and other monetary obligations upon the peasantry. This system promoted rapid growth of the population, the growth of both local and long-distance trade, and compelled the sudden return to the minting of coins. Yet even as producers were increasingly compelled to market their surplus in order to keep up with the mounting burden of rent, tithes and other feudal fines and fees, production was itself ever more closely regulated by the custom of the manor and of the guild. On the open fields, production intensified not through the introduction of new and better methods, but through ever greater numbers of peasants being tied to the land, with ever greater amounts of tribute being exacted from those peasants. Under such a system, there was minimal incentive for peasants to innovate in production. Moreover, peasants found it in their interest to engage in a subsistence strategy of diversifying their production rather than specializing in order to protect themselves against the dangers of market failure. This the peasants could do precisely because the peasants continued to enjoy direct access to the means of production, which served as the peasants' means of subsistence. The law of the manor also placed restrictions on lords as well as peasants. All were bound by the custom of the manor. Feudal lords being dependent upon appropriation of peasant surplus for those feudal lords' livelihood were also shielded from market dependence.
expanding their level of consumption and their extra economic powers to extract surplus were the ends in view of the lords of, as economic agents. With the aid of an ideological system that enshrined hierarchy, the feudal lords and their hangers-on oversaw and maintained the social order which kept the peasantry subordinate in their role as direct producers. The lords achieved their ends either by squeezing peasants and appropriating greater surpluses or through territorial expansion. Any attempts by the lords to encourage specialization or new methods yielding greater productivity were met with resistance on the part of peasants precisely because such attempts required the elimination of customary rights, legal institutions which are themselves in part the product of peasant resistance to absolute servitude and slavery. If production under feudalism was inherently antithetical to market regulation, how did market resistance become market dependency? Dobb posed the question, what in the action of feudal society itself brought about a rupture in the logic of the feudal system, leading to a new logic? In addressing this, Brenner locates the dynamic of this transition in the class relation between producers and exploiters in England, where through the enclosures and the extinguishing of customary law, the direct producers were divorced from the means of production and gradually rendered market dependent. In choosing to make class relations central to his analysis, Brenner asserts that he is offering an alternative to class analysis, which treats class as arising more or less directly out of the requirements of surplus generation and the growth of production in response to the opportunities and pressures of trade. According to Brenner, economic development cannot be determined solely by the laws of supply and demand. Rather, the course of economic development is ultimately determined by structures of class relations which are the product of class struggle. Most debates that have dealt with the role of English agriculture in relation to the development of capitalism have focused almost exclusively on quantitative levels of output. Brenner has argued that economic models which understand economic development in terms of the response of given sectors of an economy to economic or demographic growth and the laws of supply and demand are due from the start by their implicit or explicit denial of the determining influence of class structure upon economic development. Quote, most cr crudely stated, end quote, writes Brenner, quote, it is the structure of class relations, of class power, which will determine the manner and degree to which particular demographic and commercial changes will affect long-term trends in the distribution of income and economic growth, and not vice versa. End quote. Brenner. In dealing with the challenges thrown up by his critics, Brenner argues that their arguments tend to follow one of two well-tried models, the demographic model and the commercial model. Footnote. Wood identifies the Piren thesis as one example of the commercialization model. According to Piren, the revival of commerce in Europe in the 12th century led to the emergence of new, more commercially oriented cities and the, quote, revival, end quote, of a burr or, quote, capitalist, end quote, class, making the expansion of markets inevitable. Wood notes that while this thesis, quote, has been controversial and generally superseded, end quote, its critics, quote, have seldom questioned the tacit assumptions on which it rested, end quote. End of footnote. Brenner sets up a kind of proof whereby he shows that while all of Europe experienced a tremendous growth of population and a growth of trade in the early modern period, the effects of these phenomena were different in different regions of Europe. Only in England did a system of agrarian capitalism develop, whereby the peasantry was rapidly being displaced by tenant farmers, renting out enclosed fields in an incipient market involving competition for leaseholds. For Brenner, these differing results had to do with differences in class structure. Brenner's insistence upon the centrality of class issues in understanding historical change and economic development led him to a critique of what he calls, quote, neo-Smithian, end quote, Marxism. <laughs> 
footnote, Brenner. Oh, and a footnote. Excuse me. Brenner criticizes these Marxist authors who continue to rely on the classical liberal understanding that what gives rise to self-sustaining growth or capitalist economic development is an ongoing extension of the division of labor leading to continual gains in productivity and an ever-expanding scope of trade. In the classical and neoclassical Smithian paradigm, the division of labor gives rise to innovation and improvement in material production. The division of labor improves dexterity, saves time, and facilitates and abridges labor upon the introduction of machinery. Smith wrote, quote, It is the great multiplication of the productions of all the different arts in consequence of the division of labor which occasions in a well-governed society that universal opulence which extends itself to the lowest ranks of the people." End quote. Smith as the Industrial Revolution involved enormous productivity gains which were achieved in conjunction with the widespread introduction of new labor-saving devices, economic progress has commonly been associated with the advance of machine technology. In the Neo-Smithian framework, the logical site for the growth and elaboration of more and more refined production processes is urban manufacturing, quote, handicraft, end quote, production, as the perennial site of relatively more advanced technologies and division of labor. More or less uncritically, the Industrial Revolution has been viewed within this framework as the realization of latent possibilities for productive activities prefigured in earlier developments, brought about by the continuation of the logical unfolding of the division of labor. This has served to obscure the importance of agrarian capitalism and the development of capitalist market-dependent social relations in England, laying the foundation for industrial capitalism. The Elusive Origins of Capitalism and Industrialization The most difficult question regarding the Industrial Revolution in most accounts has been its timing. Some historians have completely opted out of the problem of how to explain the timing of the Industrial Revolution by denying that any such event ever took place. The view of, quote, the Industrial Revolution as a unique or important watershed in economic or social life, end quote, fell out of favor in the 1920s and 30s after J. H. Clapham's Economic History of Modern Britain was published, ushering in a period of orthodoxy for a gradualist interpretation. This interpretation was based on macroeconomic views of the British economy and sector-based studies which showed that non-mechanized labor and small firms continued to predominate in industry into the second half of the 19th century. While the graduate... I'm sorry, I had to glance at a grasp graph and I can't I can't uh, put that graph into words in any way that anyone will listen to or I'll even follow myself so we're skipping a graph here but the graph is is of a table of rates of growth in Britain from 1700 to 1831 percent per year and it's about uh, Never mind. I can't. I can't even do that. <laughs> While the gradualist interpretation no longer enjoys a position of orthodoxy, footnote: the gradualist school did maintain its adherence, 
Thus, at, as late as 1982, Professor Cameron wrote of the Industrial Revolution that, quote, the very concept is a positive hindrance to historical understanding, end quote. What has survived is an understanding that end footnote. What has under, survived is an understanding that aggregate rates of economic growth in Britain during the early Industrial Revolution were low, rarely exceeding two percent per annum, by comparison with later periods of economic boom. Despite this quote low end quote rate of growth, however, the gradualist approach no longer holds up when we look at more recent data. We can see from table point one, the table I was just talking about, that England experienced a steady and remarkable growth in output throughout the period, even if not achieving the kind of spectacular growth rates associated with Rostowian, quote, takeoff, end quote. Peter Matthias finds the metaphor of, quote, revolution, end quote, overdramatic. Nevertheless, Peter Matthias does support the notion of a historical watershed. Quote, Judged against the long perspectives of recorded history, the late 18th century did see pivotal, ch pivotal changes of this nature and the development of new trends which may be claimed in retrospect to have changed the entire nature of the economy and to have established the watershed between an essentially medieval and an essentially modernized context in the economic sense. There is a simple way of demonstrating the truth of this assertion. If the long-term trends in the rate of growth of the economy in the two centuries after 1780 are projected backwards, before 1780, the economy would have virtually ceased to exist. End quote. Footnote. Matthias reprints the figures from Crafts given here in Table Point One, but is apparently looking at an earlier edition of Floud and McCloskey's book. Thus, the quote new end quote figures for Matthias appear slightly different from the quote new figures end quote in Table Point One. This does not affect the argument here, however. End footnote. Anyone who travels through towns like Bolton, Rochdale or Wigan in Lancashire will see hillside after hillside covered with honeycomb tracks of workers' houses thrown up in rapid fashion during the accelerated growth of the towns in this region during the early part of the Industrial Revolution when the cotton mills were going up all around. By 1773, Manchester had barely 300,000 inhabitants. In 1790, Manchester had 50,000 inhabitants. In 1801, it had 95,000 inhabitants. Jesus Christ. What a double, almost double in 10 years. It's fucking nuts. Or 11 years. By 1927, the figure had reached nearly 1 million. That's seriously insane. The towns of this region all experienced this enormous growth of population in a short time. This was due to the steady and ever-increasing influx of workers arriving to work in the cotton mills and later around Leeds in the newly mechanized woolen mills. There's a footnote here. No, there's not. Okay, no footnote. In the late 18th century, wage labor was nothing new, either on the farm or in the manufacturing sector. It was the scale of the new factory operations which was decisively novel, not because the mills could employ hundreds of workers at a time, but because of the steady and continuous increase in the numbers of people employed in the ever-increasing numbers of factories and the quantity of the product produced. The effects of this transformation were, of course, profound. In his introduction to the conditions of the working, excuse me, the condition, not conditions, the condition of the working class in England, Engels cites the proletariat as the chief product of the Industrial Revolution. Quote, population becomes centralized just as capital becomes centralized. And very naturally, 
Since the human being, the worker, is regarded in manufacture simply as a piece of capital for the use of which the manufacturer pays interest under the name of wages, a manufacturing establishment requires many workers employed together in a single building, living near each other, and forming a village of themselves in the case of a good-sized factory." End quote. So footnote here that I missed. There were large concentrations of workers in manufacturing enterprises prior to the 18th century. John Winchcombe is said to have employed hundreds in his wool manufactory in the early 16th century. We will take up the question of why such large operations did not herald the onset of the Industrial Revolution in the next chapter. End footnote. Engels, 24 at the time, was not focused upon statistical rates of growth, but rather on the effects of industrialization upon the people of England. For Engels, there was little question that the Industrial Revolution amounted to an enormous transformation in both economy and way of life. Footnote. Engels even took the dysecological and health effects of urbanization took note of the dyscological and health effects of urbanization. Quote, The centralization of population in great cities exercises of itself an unfavorable influence. The atmosphere of London can never be so pure, so rich in oxygen as the air of the country, two and a half million pairs of lungs, 250,000 fires, crowded upon an area three to four miles square, consume an enormous amount of oxygen, which is replaced with difficulty because the method of building cities in itself impedes ventilation. The carbonic acid gas, engendered by respiration and fire, remains in the streets for, reasons, for reason of its specific gravity, and the chief air current passes over the roofs of the city. The lungs of the inhabitants fail to receive the due supply of oxygen, and the consequence is mental and physical lassitude and low vitality. For this reason, the dwellers in the cities are far less exposed to acute and especially to inflammatory affections than rural populations who live in a free, normal atmosphere, but they suffer the more from chronic affections." End, quote. End of footnote. In the 1950s and 60s, a number of, quote, heroic accounts were written. These writings did not dispute the timing of the Industrial Revolution, but rather emphasized the importance of the innovative entrepreneur. Authors such as Aldcroft, Cruzet, and McClelland stressed the humility, austerity, and formative childhood years of the great entrepreneurs. Such an emphasis seems to suggest that if such men were relocated to an earlier historical period or another geographical location, or if these great men were reared in a similar fashion in other times or places, the Industrial Revolution might have happened earlier or might have originated somewhere other than England. But the intellectual or psychological constitution of the pioneers of industry is not the issue. These economic agents were operating within a specific historical, social, and geographical context of an emerging social logic of market competition as an imperative, an imperative that was absent in other contexts. There is no debate that the Industrial Revolution in England involved a tremendous growth in the application of new mechanical innovations in the scent industrial production. This fact was let has led to a tendency to give pride of place to a machine technology excuse me this fact has led to a tendency to give pride of place to machine technology in conceptions of the industrial revolution in unbound prometheus ds landis proclaims quote in the 18th century a series of inventions transformed the manufacture of cotton in england and gave rise to a new mode of production the factory system. During these years, other branches of industry affected comparable advances, and all these together, mutually reinforcing one another, made possible 
further gains on an ever-widening front. They may be subsumed under three principles, the substitution of machines, rapid, regular, precise, tireless, for human skill and effort, the substitution of inanimate or animate sources of power, thereby opening to man a new and almost unlimited supply of energy, the use of new and far more abundant raw materials, in particular the substitution of mineral for vegetable or animal substances." End quote. Footnote. Below we will explain why Landis is not, strictly speaking, a technological determinist, while G.A. Cohen arguably is. Uh, for those interested, uh, I have an audio book on my channel titled The Violence of Abstraction by Derek Sayers. Is it Sayers or Sayers? I can't remember. Unimportant. Well, it is important, but for Google searches or whatever, but... His, the entire book is like an extended critique of G. H. Cohen's uh, technological determinist uh, conception of historical materialism. Anyway, end of footnote. So if you want to check that out, maybe check it out. I would also say that uh, the uh, Ellen Mason's Wood uh, book that I have is also a critique of uh, technological determinist Marxism uh, in her explanation of the origins of capitalism and uh, this book also is within that tradition of Brenner and Wood so uh, yeah maybe check that out I'd like to make some recordings of some of Brenner's work but I just haven't because you know uh, I just haven't <laughs> okay uh, and a footnote let me get back to reading and stop promoting myself. It is as if technological development is the, quote, motor, end quote, of industrial development. Landis's view is close to popular conceptions still prevalent today as evidenced in most contemporary science fiction in which historical process is seen as intimately bound up with the advance of machine technology and may even depend upon the advance of, of machine technology. Some contemporary Marxists have elaborated theories of technological determinism according to which the development of the productive forces acts as the, quote, prime mover, end quote, of historical change. Footnote. See Cohen, 1978, which is, uh, I think the book's titled Marx's Theory of History, A Defense, or, or it's called A Defense of Marx's Theory of History. Um, but right here it's referencing the chapter 6 of that book, The Primacy of the Productive Forces. Technological determinism, end of footnote, technological determinism obscures the necessity of understanding the social and historical context underpinning what was a new imperative to seek out and integrate cost-cutting measures into an emerging system of capitalist industry. Critics of the, quote, prime mover, end quote, approach have emphasized productivity increase, increases in many branches of early manufacturers. Were to note new machineries, words, excuse me, hold on one second. Critics of the quote prime mover end quote approach have emphasized productivity increases in many branches of early manufacturers where no new machineries were applied. Hobsbawm and others have emphasized how relatively modest the technological advances were in, for example, the early cotton mills. Landis' claim that interventions transformed the manufacture of cotton seems to have put the cart before the horse. One clear advantage of Brenner's approach is that Brenner's approach encourages us to theorize technological development within nascent industries as change which reflects the imperatives of new forms of class relations, not simply as the application of scientific advances to opportunities afforded by higher levels of trade. This logically leads us towards exploring the social and historical context of the Industrial Revolution in search of causes and factors that provided the impetus for a dynamic expansion of industry and technology. Thus, in place of Landis's formula, a more plausible hypothesis would be as follows. 
new forms of the social organization of manufacturing cotton, necessitated by competitive market pressures, transform the method of integrating machine technology into the labor process. The reorganization of production along factory lines provided the basis for the productivity gains achieved. Thus, the social organization of labor is an integral part of the advance of technology. The integration of labor-saving devices within this framework further enhanced such productivity gains and helped to, quote, tip the scales, end quote, decisively in favor of capital. If there is anything about which there appears to be a general consensus within the literature is that there was no specific moment when the epochal event known as the Industrial Revolution occurred. Another approach to defining the Industrial Revolution is to see the Industrial Revolution as a distended process which divides two historical periods or epochs. For Carlo M. Kipola, no revolution in history has been as dramatically, as quote, dramatically revolutionary as the Industrial Revolution, except perhaps the Neolithic Revolution, end quote. The continuity which characterizes the pre-industrial world, a continuity rooted in methods of production as well as in knowledge and methods of understanding, was according to Coppola, quote, broken between 1750 and 1850, end quote. Having set these temporal parameters and having made the strong case for the significance of the Industrial Revolution and the Industrial Revolution's sweeping transformative character, we might expect Kipola to zero in on the period in question and offer an explanation of precisely what happened between 1750 and 1850 that so totally transformed the character of human society. Instead, however, Kipola asks us to look deep into the preceding centuries in order to understand the origins of the Industrial Revolution. Kipola suggests that the city-states of northern Italy and later the southern Low Countries and northern France were sites of urban revolt against, quote, the predominant agrarian feudal order. It was the beginning of the end of a society in which power and economic resources were based exclusively on landed property and were monopolized by social groups whose ideals were chiefly fighting, hunting, or preying. In its place, there began to grow a society based on commerce, manufacturing, and the professions, inspired by the ideals of expediency, profit, and to some extent, reason. The warlord and the monk were replaced by the merchant and the professional. The civilization based on these two characters developed quickly and within a few centuries had conquered Western Europe. A cumulative process reinforced and refined its structures, both institutional and human, end quote. Kipola appears to make four assumptions in this, co in this statement. One, that modern industrial society came about through the extension of urban trade and manufactures, while its precursor feudalism was intrinsically rural-based. Two, that this growth was driven forward by the rationality of profit maximization. Three, that this was a cumulative process. Four, that such a historical process was experienced in common across Western Europe. Each of these assumptions will be challenged in the course of this work. Coming to Kipola's explanation of the Industrial Revolution after 1750, we are told that there is an, quote, obvious continuity, end quote, between the sketches of Hanacourt and the machines of Da Vinci and the discoveries of Newton. By the end of the 17th century, this movement of an emerging mechanical conception of the universe reached its peak, recognizable in Baconian philosophy. At this critical juncture, Holland might have seen the likely place for an explosion in productive improvements. By harnessing wind power on an unprecedented scale as exemplified by the production of the Floyd, a smaller, lower, a smaller, slower, but more efficient cargo ship. The Dutch attempted to maximize their profits not according to the age-old tradition of insisting upon the high quality of goods and therefore maximizing profit per unit of production, but by demonstrating a willingness to sacrifice quality in order to expand the quantity of goods sold. For Kipola, this, was rep this represented a, quote, decisive move towards mass production, end quote. Why then was Holland not the first country to experience an industrial revolution? Kipola explains that, quote, 
she, which I'm assuming she means Holland, was imperceptibly ossifying into conservatism, and Holland was losing leadership in a progressively greater number of fields. Moreover, England possessed coal, and Holland did not possess coal. End quote. Let us take note that Kipola implies here that an industrial revolution in Holland was possible, even likely, had coal and more progressive politicians been available. Historical accident apparently blocked this imminent potential. Brenner's interpretation is that the Netherlands did in fact develop capitalist agriculture early on, but that the Netherlands' capitalist development was, quote, stimmied, end quote, because unlike England, this growth had not been accompanied by the development of the domestic market. Wood challenges Brenner's interpretation using Brenner's approach to the problem in analyzing capitalist markets as a form of social property relation. For Wood, the Netherlands may have seen the growth of market dependence in agriculture, but she questioned whether this was actually capitalist. Involving the compulsion to revolutionize production or merely the kind of market dependence that follows from large-scale growth of markets is opportunity. Charles Post adds, that the absence of market compulsion induced Dutch peasants to revolutionize their agrarian techniques would have posed a domestic limit to further growth. Sorry, I'll get to repeat that. Charles Post adds that the absence of market compulsions inducing Dutch peasants to revolutionize their agrarian techniques would have posed a domestic limit to further growth. In addition to Brenner's external limit, the feudal commercial relations of the European economy. Kipola points to four factors which helped precipitate an industrial revolution in England. One, privateering. Two, the aggressive pursuit of foreign trade. Three, the protectionist policies of the British government and four, the role of immigrants as craftsmen, inventors, and especially merchants who facilitated the growth of foreign trade. Kipola does not offer any clear causal explanation of the Industrial Revolution as it first emerged in England. Instead, Kipola not only seeks to extend the Industrial Revolution's origins back in time to the 12th and 13th centuries in northern Italy, Kipola, but Kipola also wants to expand the definition of the term forward in time <coughs> towards the as yet unfinished business of industrializing the non-industrialized portions of the globe. Kipola's earlier assertion that the Industrial Revolution ushers in a quote, completely new end quote, world now seems awkward unless we are to understand it less as a description of a historical event and more as a general organizing principle for dichotomizing the world into the two halves the advanced capital industrial nations, and the, quote, backward, end quote, non-industrialized nations. What was the social basis for this imminent potential for industrial progress? By what social process did the mechanistic view of nature manage to affect such an ominous transformation as the Industrial Revolution? We will see in Chapter 6 that though da Vinci conceptualized many of the mechanical devices involved in the textile revolution, of the 18th century, it will remain to be answered why the application of these designs took four centuries to be realized. These lingering questions ha leave Kipola's analysis incomplete at best. Fernand Braudel and Emmanuel Wallerstein are two authors who argue that the origins of the capitalist, quote, world system were traceable to the 14th century on, excuse me, were traceable, Fernand, Fer <laughs> Fernand Bradell and Emmanuel Wallerstein are two authors who argue that the origins of the capitalist, quote, world system, end quote, are traceable to the 14th century or earlier. Wallerstein dates the origins of a, quote, European world economy based on the capitalist mode of production, end quote, from the 16th century. But capitalists did not, quote, flaunt their colors before the world, end quote, in this century, according to Wallerstein, nor was the ideology of free trade emergent any time before the 18th or 19th centuries. Bradell goes further back in time 
citing India's seizure or penetration of the East Indies and Rome's hold on the greater Mediterranean as the beginnings of a, quote, biography, end quote, of capital in some form, criticizing those, quote, cautious, end quote, historians who could not speak of capitalism being present in the 16th or even 18th century, Burdell argues that the Industrial Revolution did represent a, quote, major break with the past, end quote, but maintains that, quote, throughout even this formidable transformation, capitalism remained essentially true to itself. Is it not in the nature of capitalism a sort of rule of the game, Burdell asks, that it thrives on change, drawing strength from change, being ready at any moment to expand or contract itself to the dimensions of the all-enveloping context, which, as we have seen, limits in every period the possibilities of the human economy everywhere in the world, end quote. If capitalism can indeed be compared to the rules of a game, several questions immediately arise. Who are the players, and who plays the role of referee and enforcer or interpreter of the rules? Where are the boundaries? What is it about the rules that gives the rules the internal consistency of a, quote, game, end quote? Defining winners, losers, draws, foul play, a beginning and an end, end quote. a beginning and an end. And most crucially, where and when were the rules established and by whom? In this passage, capitalism is again conceived as a general organizing principle, a heading under which disparate processes of production and social life are grouped apparently by the fact that all involve some degree of profit motive. <coughs> but Burdell and Wallerstein avoid offering any precise definition of capitalism, allowing the term capitalism to take on a meta-historical quality. By effectively universalizing capitalism, Burdell and Wallerstein lose sight of its specificity and have themselves the trouble of inquiring into the specific geographical and historical origins of the capitalist property relations. What Burdell and Wallerstein stress is the commonality of developments across Western Europe from at least the 15th century. The rise of trade, the establishment of new and extensive international trading networks, the conquering of overseas territories, the settlement of colonies, the competition among, amongst empires for foreign territory and sources of minerals, all of these developments were common to Western Europe in the early modern period, while each state was quite distinct and had its own mode of operation. The emergence of an international system of European states and empires is, in fact, distinguishable as a transformative era in European history, with the implications for world history. Excuse me, with implications for world history. Furthermore, there can be no argument with the thesis that among the central factors behind industrialization were there were developments such as the emergence of this international system of national states which were common to Western Europe in the early modern period. The competitive expansion of empires is itself traceable to a certain logic and social dynamic which these states undoubtedly share. But it bears asking, if capitalism and industrial revolution were prefigured in such early developments as the rise of the northern Italian city-states, then why did it take 500 years for this dynamic to be realized? The thesis that capitalism was common to Western Europe, with deep roots into the feudal era, and that the Industrial Revolution was foretold in the works of early modern scientists, such as da Vinci, amounts to a te teleological thesis in which the Industrial Revolution stands as the culmination of many economic developments occurring in disparate geographical and historical settings. Whether capitalism is seen as with Kipola, Wallerstein, or Burdell in the rise of trade from the 13th century, or is to be understood a la Weber, as existing wherever historians find markets present, the view that capitalism had long dominated European history prior to the Industrial Revolution shifts the causes of the Industrial Revolution away from questioning linking, questions linking it to the development of capitalism towards issues specific to industrialization per se. Specifically, the advance of technology. <clears throat>
This delinking of the issues of the origins of capitalism and the Industrial Revolution leads the prefigurative thesis to founder on three fundamental questions best expressed by Eric Hobsbawm. One, quote, why it was Britain which became the first, quote, workshop of the world, end quote, end quote. Two, quote, why this breakthrough occurred towards the end of the 18th century and not before or after, end quote. And, quote, how it was ignited and how, oh, excuse me, quote, how it was ignited and we may add what stopped the first explosion from fizzling out over an impressive initial bang, end quote. Abbreviated, these may be understood as the where, the when, and the how of the Industrial Revolution. The when is critical. If Kipola, for example, admits that the Industrial Revolution represents a radical break with the past, then why stress the continuity of capitalism? Putting forth the redundant argument that the Industrial Revolution was precipitated by applying scientific methods of engineering to manufacturing does not take us one step further in finding answers to Hobsbawm's quote, where, when, and how, end quote. It is here that the theory of English agrarian capitalism looms so large. Conclusion By examining social change and social conflict during the period leading up to and including the British Industrial Revolution, this work seeks to demonstrate how the direct producing classes, first in agriculture, then in manufacturing, sought to shield themselves from exposure to market forces, and how the direct producing classes' defeat and subsequent exposure was integral to the development of capitalist industry. The transition to capitalism in England came about as a result of a protracted process involving class struggle between the direct producers and surplus appropriators, both a acting as economic agents seeking to reproduce themselves as they were, but culminating in the unintended consequence of general market dependence and new economic imperatives. English peasants lost their direct access to land as the means of subsistence, whilst lords became landed proprietors appropriating rents from tenant farmers to whom they provided access to land appropriating rents from tenant farmers to whom they provide access to land, the means of production by way of economic leases. Unlike peasants, agrarian capitalist tenant farmers became subject to new market pressures in the form of competition for leases as well as price competition, which made the transformation of production into the direction of greater efficiency imperative. For the capitalist tenant farmer, Economic survival came to depend upon finding ways to maximize output by either increasing the scale of production or by improving productivity through specialization and innovation. Economic leasehold gave the tenant command over all decisions affecting the production process, thus allowing for the possibility of treating land and labor as abstract inputs and thus making possible the appearance of a new type of social property relation, capital. As all the agents of agrarian production, direct producers, tenant farmers, and landlords came into a situation of market dependence, market imperatives and capitalist system and the capitalist system of production were reinforced by the growth of output, of population, of demand, by the steady improvement of agrarian productivity, and by the steady decline in the cost of living. Central to this process was the abolition of the customary law and the conversion of all land to freehold tenor under common law, thereby redefining the role of the state away from, the up, from upholding social relations rooted in custom toward becoming the enforcer of property rights and economic contracts between buyers and sellers in the marketplace. This could, thus could the coercive powers of the state be invoked to suppress resistance to enclosures and the advance of agrarian capitalism. During the centuries prior to the Industrial Revolution, English manufacturing underwent a considerable degree of transformation, much but not all of which can be attributed to the development of agrarian capitalism. In general, 
the production process continued to be regulated by customary or extra economic forms of social regulation right down to the Industrial Revolution. In fact, the number of workers engaged in manufacturing grew tremendously as direct producers in agriculture were extruded from agrarian production and looked to domestic handicraft production as an alternative means of, to a livelihood. With the advance of agrarian capitalism and market dependency, the pressure of the market imperative continued to grow. The growing power of capital was first felt by domestic craft workers through the loss of direct access to markets. For example, merchant employers engaging in, quote, putting out, end quote, arrangements, exerted control over not only the tr craft workers' access to markets, but also their means of production. However, the strength of a workers' organization, the strength of workers' organizations, and state-level support for customary modes of regulating labor in manufacturing posed a significant barrier to the ability of capitalist employers to enjoy an unlimited capacity to transform production in response to market imperatives. This set the stage for an epochal class struggle between an artisan-led resistance seeking to defend custom and employers seeking to abolish apprenticeship rules and all customary forms of labor regulation and ultimately to assume full command over production decisions in manufacturing by taking direct control of the labor process away from the workers. The artisan-led resistance to these efforts was only successfully suppressed through the application of the powers of the state, both legislative and coercive, and only after many generations of class struggle involving successive waves of often violent conflict, climaxing in the first half of the 19th century. Throughout this period, the landed oligarchy, whose wealth continued to be drawn primarily from agrarian capitalist rents, managed to retain control over state power. Based on the landed oligarchy's experience with the, process, with the success of, quote, improved, end quote, agriculture, the oligarchs would have shared an ideological bias in favor of the capitalist employer's effort to, quote, improve, end quote, production and manufacturing. But the specific factors that drew the state into taking sides in the class struggle between capital and labor in manufacturing had more to do with politics than economics. Since the leadership and the core of support for the radical movement for popular democracy were largely drawn from the community of skilled artisans, artisanal organizations, particularly trade unions or, quote, combinations, end quote, of workers, it came to be perceived as a serious political threat to the Hanover Hanoverian state, one which had to be suppressed. The state's response to the revival of radicalism in Britain during and after the French and Napoleonic Wars thus hastened the advance of capital and manufacturing. Contrary to those who would view the state as a passive agent in Britain's Industrial Revolution, the historical fact that the artisan-led resistance to the conversion to capitalism in British manufacturing was only overcome through the direct application of state power demonstrates that the state played a very active and central role in the Industrial Revolution. Moreover, the fact that this application of state power was directed not by a rising class of industrialists, but by the ruling landed oligarchy testifies to the fact that the Industrial Revolution in Britain grew out of and continued to be shaped by the social property relations of agrarian capitalism. While the emergence of capital as a social property relation, excuse me, while the emergence of capital as a social property relation and capital's associated market imperatives arose from the unintended consequences of class struggle, being realized first in the form of agrarian capitalism, the fact that the development of both agrarian and industrial capitalism involved class struggles and the application of state force meant that it is untenable, excuse me, means that it is untenable to view capitalism as an economic system that resulted from the quote natural end quote evolution of European society and economy out of feudalism, fulfilling the latent potentialities of pre-capitalist commerce and industry.
Sorry, they're doing road work nearby, so, uh, and I'm not closing the windows because it's a million degrees. Um, so hopefully you can still hear me. Uh, and if you can't hear me, it's your lucky day because it's good not to hear me talk. <laughs> On the contrary, in order to be realized, the modern capitalist economy and social order had to be imposed upon those who sought to resist the modern capitalist economy and social order. In order to fully appreciate this thesis, it will be necessary to explore both the economic and political history of Britain through this long period of struggle, paying particular attention to the role of the state in shaping events and outcomes. The plan of this book is both thematic and chrono chronological. Part one concentrates on the history of manufacturing in England in the context of the emergence of an agrarian capitalism which transformed the English economy from the 14th century onward. We explore the impact on manufacturing of the overall transformation of the economy through the extinguishing of customary law in agriculture, the expansion of the domestic system and putting out operations, the growth of a domestic market fueled by the increasing market dependence of workers, employers, and landlords, the increasing productivity of English agriculture and the falling price of grain, and therefore labor. We trace an evolutionary process of stratification within the old craft guilds, many of which were overtaken by the merchant or, quote, livery, end quote, element, while small masters and journeymen struggled in to either preserve or recreate the small masters and journeymen's craft companies, or formed friendly societies for mutual economic protection and support. In addressing the upheavals of the 17th century, we explore how the increasing wealth and power of landowners, renting to capitalist tenant farmers, translated into their victory over the crown and a transformation of the state whereby parliament, as the expression of the power of the land and oligarchy, entered into a kind of ruling partnership with the monarchy. As we, will, as we enter the 18th century, we examine how agrarian capitalism actually served to bolster ruling class solidarity, whilst also providing the economic muscle necessary for Britain to prevail in successive wars with France, suffering defeat in only one of these wars, the American War of Independence. Despite the loss of America and other rebellions within the empire as well as in England, agrarian capitalism and an emerging industrialization at home helped secure Britain's young empire, an empire which was itself not specifically capitalist. Part one closes with an examination of the area, excuse me, part one closes with an examination of the era of high parliamentary enclosures in the late 18th century. As the Industrial Revolution had been set in motion, the process of agrarian capitalism, excuse me, the processes of American capitalism, we're approaching those processes, logical conclusion. The commodification of all land in Britain through enclosures and extinguishing of customary law, bringing about a full conversion to market dependency. Part two deals with the question of the role of capital and technology in the Industrial Revolution. By briefly reviewing the development of technology throughout history, we seek to show that it was only under conditions of capitalist social relations in Britain that technology was first applied systematically to production in the interest of maximizing productivity in the pursuit of profits. We then seek to understand how in the early 18th century the factory emerged alongside the workhouse as means of putting idle hands and pauper children to work. We also examine the economic pressures that conditioned the systematic application of machinery to production. We argue that what was absolutely necessary for capitalist industry, even prior to the advent of machinery, was for the owner of the means of production to assume control over the labor process, a control that had hitherto always belonged to the laborers themselves. This sets the stage for the long-term struggle over control of the labor process between owner employers and workers that becomes central that becomes central to part 3
Part two concludes with a discussion of the different understandings of capital and capital's role in the Industrial Revolution. We seek to show how the capitalist transformation of manufacturing required not only the dismantling of customary control of the labor process, but also the positive action of constructing new institutions that would lay the foundation for the Industrial Revolution and a capitalist social order. In part three, we turn our attention to the artisan-led resistance to industrial capitalism and the arrival of the factory, paying particular attention to the role of the state. Between the end of the American War and the early years of the French Wars, struggles over custom in both agriculture and industry came to the fore. We look at how the coercive and legislative powers of the state were brought to bear in defeating a popular resistance that sought to defend customary rights, especially, excuse me, specifically the Tudor statutes, which had recognized and legitimized the customary regulations of the guilds. As these statutes were increasingly disregarded and ultimately would be repealed, Parliament introduced a long list of draconian laws designed to secure the absolute property rights of landowners. We examine how this, quote, bloody code, end quote, related to the growth and influence of political economy as an ideological defense of property and of capitalism. We then seek to understand the period between the end of the French Wars and the defeat of the last Chartist petition in 1848 as one in which the power of the landed oligarchy reached its apex, even as the growing wealth of capitalist manufacturers began to pose a challenge. Despite this apparent schism between two factions of the ruling class, the increasingly self-organized, quote, working class, end quote, was nonetheless confronted with a unity of class interests between landowners and industrialists through the state, and continued to resist the ongoing imposition of the social relation of capital, some putting forward visions of an alternative society, while others sought to advance the interests of workers within the framework of capitalist social relations, by pressing for a role in setting state policy through the expansion of the franchise. As these struggles played out, the general framework of industrial capitalist class relations and corresponding state institutions took shape. End of introduction.